We are. We're live, mate. We're not live. live. I say that we're live. We're not live. We're live. We're recording. We're recording. Okay. Uh, Steve. Steve. Welcome to the studio. Full disclosure. Just quickly. You're my cousin. Okay. Yeah. Alleged. Yeah. Alleged. Alleged. Well, it depends. Who I'm talking to. Do you know Steve Murray? Uh, uh, no way. I did not know that man. I do not yeah, know that no, man. You know. <laughs> Do you, know, do you know the funny thing about that, right? It's because I work with schools, right? There was, a, like, um, you've got to get Garda vetted. And there was a time when if you Googled Stephen Murray, you would get a guy, the main headline was man arrested for crimes that would not allow me into schools. Let me just say that. And uh, he was a Galway man living in Dublin. I was... I had been living in Dublin and was living in Galway. He was about five years younger than me. I, I always looked about five years younger than I was. It was so close in everything that I didn't do time for crimes that he did, because I never would. Anyway, so yeah. Uh, one second. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I was looking at the wrong thing. I do apologize, Uncle. Uh Snip that little section out. Might be back. <laughs> a minor technical hitch. Um, question for you, then. Mm. Question for you. Because believe it or not, you may have told me a lot about your past. Most of it would have been drunk. I don't remember anything in the drunk. Yeah. Or, or, you tend to have or you might have been there. I may have been there, but very young. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. But, yeah. but uh, it is certainly, um, it's certainly, I think, genuinely, I think there's a lot I think in this conversation I'm going to learn from. I okay. learn about. Um, and uh, I don't want to hear it. I want to hear it. So, do you think you could be? Do you think you could you could be the person you are now? Which I assume you you think you're a good person, achieving things, doing good for the mm -hmm. world, right? As right. opposed Oops. to bad. Yeah, yeah, Generally yeah. Generally yeah. good than bad, right? Yeah. Do you think you could be you are now um, if you had lived a different past, lived a different life? No, it's a really interesting question, and here's why. I had no idea growing up, right, that I came from. We came from. Um, a wealthy family. I had no idea, right? That, that I, the idea that we might have come from any kind of money at all just didn't make sense. Um, and then, you know, like, as I got older and I learned things about, um, you know, my past, etc. I remember there being a story that your mother told me about when we lived in the shelter for victims of domestic violence, which was the first ever women's aid shelter uh, established by um, Erin Pitsy uh, during the 1970s. And, you know, to be honest, it was a bit of a shithole. You know, like there was bare, bare, bare pipes, bare electricity, rats, you know, like, and, um, you know, like, um, I remember your mom saying that, that, that at the time, our grandfather had plotted to come over and take us back because my mom was staying there because, you know, coming home to Ireland as a single mother in the 70s wasn't that attractive. But also she was a young woman trying, just wanting to do it on her own. And when, when I found out more about our family and, and the wealth that was there, and look, I realized that had our grandfather taken me back, I would have been raised on the farm. You know, I would probably have gone to Clongo's Wood, where, you know, our uncles went to, you know, which is one of the elite schools in, and it definitely wouldn't have been the same. And, and I look at that, and I also, then I look at my father's life, who was, you know, who was privately educated, you know, he was a handsome and athletic man, s smart and charming, who got everything in his door, ev everything on his lap, and didn't learn I don't know what happened, but I think things were very easy for him. And dealing with some of the trials of, you know, that come up to you. I think growing up poor and going to what I went to stood me in better st stead to face the trials ahead than had I had a more comforted living. And that's to say to people who have come from wealthy backgrounds don't go through trials because I definitely think our family, our own family, even though they might have been wealthy, I don't think it was an easy, I, I don't think they knew growing up they were wealthy because I think it was quite a difficult, you know, like strict religious household. As in our parents. Yeah, 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 both our parents. So, so, I, so, so I, I've often thought oh, about... Our mums, we should say, our mums. Our mums, yeah, our mums, our uncles, etc. I often thought that like... Because that was a very real possibility that, that, that I could have been taken home to Ireland, raised, raised on the farm, sent to an elite school, um, my worldview would have been 
would have been different. Like, you know, at, at least would have been different. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I, th I think we are all reflections of our experiences and our influences. So any change in that will change our trajectory. I don't really believe in that if, if I could do it all over again, i do exactly the same thing. Well, I, I kind of think if you could do it over again, you'd do exactly the same thing all over again. You know, I'm, I'm a firm believer of that. And so I think that if, if my life had been different, I think uh, it was, it, I would have been different. Hmm. You know. What's your, what's your earliest memory of writing? What's the first creative piece you wrote? First thing I ever wrote was I had a teacher called Mr. Spark, believe it or not, right? Chase Mr. School. Spark. Mr. Spark. <laughs> yeah, it was just, uh, spark or Spark? Spark. Yeah, Spark. S P A R K. As in, as in, yeah, yeah, as in, uh, as, as in Flint. And um, he was my primary school teacher at Chase Bridge. And he'd read us Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And he, and he set us the task of writing a poem based on it. And so I wrote Marley's Ghost. And all I can remember, I was eight years old, like all I can remember was him, uh, like uh, was one line of it. Thump of footstep, hammer on a nail, Marley's ghost appears. And he read it. And when he, before he read it, he just called me out to the class in front of everyone and said, how dare you, boy, you think I'm stupid? Now, this guy was like a wizard. He was like his, his, his ire, his anger. I mean, like when he got angry, the room darkened, you know, and um, oh, coffee. Um, but when, but most of the time, all that meant was you didn't make him angry because most of the time he was a wizard. You know, he was like, there were sparks coming out of his fingertips. He was animated and hilarious. And, uh, but anyway, this day he thought I'd, I got someone else to write this. So the room darkened and he called me in and I started to well up with tears. And then he realized he wrote it. He just put his... He like, thought that you had got someone else to write yeah, it. To, to write it. I okay. got an adult to write okay. it. So he kind of put his hand on my shoulders and he could see me start... I was welling up like in his considerment. He went, uh, but it's brilliant, my boy. It's brilliant. Yeah, so that was... And that same poem that I wrote when I was eight won me an award when I was 12. Huh. Yeah, at secondary school, so... Hmm. Can you... Uh, is, is it, do you think it's easy to, create, to write creatively if, um, if you've had an easy life or if you've had a hard life? I think it's either there or it's not. Um, but I think if you have a hard life, I, 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 here's what I think. I think all art validates our suffering. You think what? All art validates our suffering, right? Go on, go on. So, so what art does is art, like um, you take any film, story, whatever it is, right? Um, you take any film or story that you engage with, it's never about the best looking kid in your school who has all the girls and all the money, drives the nice cars, his re teachers love him and he's the sports champion. It's ne he's never the hero of the story. Um, the, st the hero of the story, whether it's Sophie from the BFG, Harry Potter, Luke Skywalker, nearly all of his orphans. And if you break down the story of it, right, uh, is... Um, like the stories, if you break them down, you know, like, I mean, so, you know, Luke Skywalker, spoiler alert for anyone who's not seen Star Wars, but, you know, uh, his dad was killed by Darth Vader, lives his, with his aunt and uncle who are, you know, murdered by stormtroopers, finds out from, from a Jedi that his father was murdered by Darth Vader, so he changed him to be a Jedi, long, long and short of it is, loses his best friend, Darth Vader, um, Obi-Wan. Finds out his father is Darth Vader, but, but realizes he's good, converts him to good, then his father saves him, then dies. It's a horrendous story, right? It's, but what art does is art, is art says, you know what, life is full of these trials and tribulations. It ain't easy, but, but, in, but it's an adventure. In the middle, there's romance, there's excitement, there's, you know, like, um, if you hear most love songs, they never sing about the love I have, because the love I have is like the iPhone I have. The iPhone I have is brilliant before I got it. Before I got it, I thought it was going to 3D print me a Big Mac. When I got it, the uh, best part was unwrapping it. Love is a bit like that. The best part is unwrapping it. <laughs> you know, like, but the moment you were like, like, literally as soon as I t powered up my iPhone, within about 20 minutes, I'm trying to remain excited. But it's exactly the same as my old one. You know, like, and um, I think that... Uh, like, so when you hear love songs, right, people only ever sing about loves they, love they've lost because most people are either happy in marriage, in which case it ain't the love that we were sold. It's normal. It's like the iPhone I have. Or they're in a marriage that's, or in love that is dysfunctional or they're on their own. So 
what art does is art says you ain't on your own. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, because cause, like, cause, cause the whole, the hero's journey, you know, conflict, it validates our conflicts, you know, and, uh, and our humanity. So I think that, I think that the harder the time you go through, the more you have to write about. Um, but I also think if you go through a hard time, the ability to be able to write or play music or to be able to express it is a way that allows you to, in terms of well-being and say, you know, Eastern philosophy, to bear witness to your thoughts and experiences rather to, than to inhabit them. If that makes sense. It does make sense. I'm just, I'm just thinking of um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, um, Gulag, the, Gulag, the Gulag Archipelago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the reason I'm thinking that is, I was thinking when you were talking about it, it's kind of, because I was thinking of exact, you know, it's the creative side, however you express that, it's something you, you, it cannot be stripped away. So in, a, in, mm. in Solzhenitsyn's example, he didn't have a pen and paper, or very rarely had a pen and paper. He didn't have a, if he wanted to be painted, he didn't have anything to paint on. But he didn't stop him uh, being able to write and think about things. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't, in fact, it wasn't even creative writing, but it was the mind. It's the one thing he, he couldn't take away from him was his mind. And yeah. he ended up creating this masterpiece, which was, I'll be, a, you know, a record, of, a record of his life and experiences. But it's the same thing, I think, a lot of, well, if you think about, your your experiences it becomes sort of creative side becomes an outlet or absolutely a, a, the one thing you can find enjoyment or satisfaction or motivation from mm. that isn't the misery of your life in some yeah. other fashion uh, yeah i agree and also i think as well when you look at where if you look at where like um creativity and art like you know is is at its at its most powerful if you look at like african-american you know, literature and music. You look at the Irish, like um, Irish literature, th theatre scenes. You tend to find huge creative outputs during times of oppression. Russian literature. Actually, the, the, the kids that I teach, um, I find all the Eastern European kids, man, they, they're like, their appetite for writing is like, you know, like it, now they're, they're second, third generation. But, you know, I think that, I think that wherever you have any kind of bondage, in the worst sense of the word, um, I think uh, I think uh, the only freedom you have is in your head. Do you know what I mean? That's like in like you know. So, so we will create. We will we will manifest our own story and and uh, and our own endings and create our own narratives to, to as a safety blanket and as a way of surviving as well. You know. Um, yeah, and I definitely think I definitely think uh, that I definitely think that the, the, the once you know the creative process is one that does sometimes allow you to see where your head's at, and just also to see your experiences from a different, from a, a, a more objective vista, you know. So, mm -hmm. uh. When you when you when you so when you wrote your first book, mm. that was House of Bees, right? House of Bees, House yeah. House of Bees, the first book. Mm. Did you do that as a because it would be a cathartic experience, or did you do it because you wanted to communicate uh, your experiences on paper to others? A couple of things to, there, right? Firstly, right, there was um, there was a very selfish reason for doing it, you know, which is that. You know, like um, in my 20s and 30s, struggled to find my place, of, you know, in where I was going, what I was doing. But the one I came back to poetry and writing because it was the one thing Mr. Spark had that he said to me you know, before I left London. When I, um, you know, like in, in London, I started writing poems and people had always said, God, you're brilliant at it. You know, so that was, you know, so like, so, so. Um, so I started writing when I moved to Galway because I left a career in advertising to move to Galway, sign on the door and write. And then I got involved in the literary scene, liter literature scene there, which was very vibrant. And people started saying, God, you're great. So all of a sudden now I'm doing it because I'm getting pats on the back. And then I had a couple of pieces that I'd written in my 20s that were just, just things I just spewed out about my childhood. And they clearly were the ones that got the best reaction back. So... 
when I wrote, I, I won a couple of poetry slams, which was like, it's like X Factor for poems. I got to like, go to Chicago, do shows. And um, I kind of hated it because there's part of me that's really shy. There's part of me that doesn't believe I'm good enough. There's part of me that though I get up there, I'm not being myself when I'm up there. I'm inhabiting a persona, you know. So, so I followed that. And then there, was, there, was a, there, there came a point where I just wanted to go, no, do you know what? This is, this, I, I've got to start writing real me. But the, the, the second part of that is, while it was a calling, it was, there was also an egotistical thing involved in it as well, because I knew that my story would get me published. These days, you could be the best writer in the world, but unless you've got, unless you've got a clear hook of suffering or disenfranchisement or, you know, like um, my story was one that, that, that would get press and, and getting press would sell books. So I knew that writing about, you know, like experiences of, you know, growing up, how I did, you know, would, um, yeah, I, I used it in many ways. I, I used it as much for cathartic reasons as I did for ambition as well. So I'm not sure which piggybacks off the back of which. What's thing. wrong with using it for ambition? Well, I, so nothing really, I guess. Nothing really. But I think back then, I think that like, uh, I think that, I think that as I've got older, I've become more aware of <coughs> the impact that things have on others. Do you know what I mean? So like, so... So, and every, every story has two sides to it. Never, everyone has their own narrative on it. And um, I think if I, I, I still look on that book with pride, by the way. I still look at it and go, it's great you know, book. yeah, thanks. Yeah, it was like, like, like it's one that, you know, like my next book was much better written and no one was interested in it because it didn't have, I did, didn't have my dirty laundry in it. Do you know what I mean? It didn't <laughs> have, you couldn't smell my pants. So, uh, you know, and that's what people want. People want your dirty laundry. It's a voyeuristic world. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's, uh, you know, so um, so I think that's probably what I do is like so. so yeah, so so I think I was a little bit clumsy with it. With just like I could have been more careful around certain things that were in there, and 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 the people and there were people in there that were very gracious about it. You know, so like so there was things that I was just all out. You know, I was driven by the fact that loads of people were telling me how good my writing was. Loads of people were driving me, and that kind of blinded me for a while. Um, whereas I'd love to write it again, and I will write it again. Or I, I will write another one that fifty-year-old me writes, and not thirty-two-year-old me writes. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, um, yeah, because because I definitely think that as I've got older, I have become more aware. I think as men, we get more aware of others as we get older. Do you know what I mean? I think it's something that we maybe I think women have got amazing awareness of others. Like I think, uh, I think as lads we lack that a bit. You know what I mean? We almost try. You know, I, I think that I think that is why, as men, sometimes I think we can be insensitive to the trauma of others until we experience trauma or those we care about do. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think I don't I don't sure. So I would have I would have thought that with being insensitive to the trauma of others. I'm, or. So, or or maybe it's not expressing the sense, showing sensitivity to the trauma of others. Do you know what I think? So, like, I guess well, am I explaining myself well here? I wonder if I'm um, so, so like so. I think that now this is all stuff that I've actually picked up in schools, right? So, just in schools, I learn as much from my students as I do. And I teach predominantly 15, 16 year old kids. And at the moment, loads of lads, lo like loads of, loads, of, loads of teenage boys. And when I'm having the banter with them, my workshops are very funny. Do you know what I mean? They're, they are hilarious. Like, you know, and, um, so, so, and they're borderline appropriate. You know, they're, they're risque. And lads get their, 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 their borders wrong. And lad, lads, lads come up with stuff that's unpolitically correct all the time. And I'm, like, I'm generally quite politically correct, except when it comes to editing Roald Dahl books. Like, oh, I really? I think generally watching the words that we use around each other is quite a nice thing to do. But one thing I've noticed through my work is that 
let's say, is that I don't think lads ever go out purposely to hurt people, but we say shit without realising that everyone around us has a story, has their own version of events. And all. Like I was, I was uh, given a workshop last week. Not last week, I finished two weeks. About three weeks ago, and I was in a boys' school. And, and on the Monday, I had this lad in, 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 uh, in, in the room in a rugby school and, and he dwarfism like like you know he was a dwarf basically basically and and uh, he wrote this amazing poem about being having dwarfism it was and 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 in the classroom how old was he 15 16, 15, 16 yeah Jesus. in the classroom he was so f fucking brave man he was like the biggest biggest young fella in the room he was smart he was strong so it was powerful and like and the next day, I was in a, I was, I was in a school, and uh, and one of the lads and the, and, and the lads started joking about midgets, and just went, "I would have made that fucking joke two days ago myself," and now I've read this guy, this kid's poem, and I'm like, "Whoa, okay, so, so like, so, so even even though there might not be someone in the room, there could be a brother in the room, a sister in the room, someone for whom who sees what a person goes through, and I think women are generally more sensitive to that stuff. Do you know what I mean? I think they have more awareness of it." Yeah, that is a difficult. I I have thought a lot about this myself, especially over the last few years, and Ooh. it is and it is predominantly because of the podcast. And I've met people. So, I, like, if you, you know, if you, uh, so this is episode two hundred and seven. Mm. Right, it'd be more than those interviews, but that means I've I've met and sat down with two hundred and seven people I wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. that's not you know I'm 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 think I'm meeting more people in a really substantial way, quality way. I'm not yeah, fleeting yeah. glimpse, meet them in a networking event or an office and go, hi, nice to meet you, coffee, bye. I'm sitting down an hour to two hours and literally listening to people. Yeah. And so I, the reason I've been thinking about it is because I pe meet people from different backgrounds, different experiences to what you're saying. So one of the things I've been wrestling with, sort of, on a superficial level, right, is, okay, let's, let's give an example, mm. right? Of uh, the word, a word, mong. Yeah. All right. So that, in my background and my and my my male network, but don't really that word is thrown around liberally. Right. We use it to describe a stupid person or do something stupid. We use yeah, that word yeah. to describe it. We don't use that word to describe someone and pretend, and say someone disabled. We use it to say it just it is a word that is used to say stupid. Right. Yeah, At the same yeah. time, I have utmost respect for disabled people. Right. Yeah. Uh, you, well, I like to think people would think that as well. Okay. Now, I have definitely toned down the use of that word and minimize it as much as I can. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. does happen sometimes, right? But my so but my thought is my my, my the sort of the mental somersaults I do is Is it not okay to use that word in in any circumstance? Or is it okay? And I, I'm maybe not specific to that word, but words in general, like N word, mong, midget. Well, there's different levels. So, like, so for me, a word like mong is very kind of like it's. Um, and again, like a, for me, I, I would I, I didn't even know I, I, I thought mong could have meant drunk, drunk. You know, could have meant so many different things. I, I would not have necessarily put that word there. I think some words are more explicit than others. You know what I mean? And and. Like, 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 uh, and, and actually this kid's poem as well that he wrote was about how much people love to just mock. It's open mockery. Do you know what I mean? It is like, you know, there's nothing like, there's no gray area there. Well, do you know what I mean? Well, th this, th this is the thing with the words. See? Yeah. Because mockery is such a big part of male communication. And to, I mean, to add to the, the, how significant that word is, to me, like there's people who listen to this podcast and there's friends of mine who yeah. have disabled family members okay. you know and and because that word especially in the past very old was associated with people with down syndrome specifically mm. wasn't it which is not how like, i associate that word but even so the th me so the thought of what they may think by hearing me use that word in because obviously we're just using it to describe things like using the word in a derogatory way to anything mm -hmm. but it may feel and really feel really fucking terrible yeah which goes back to is it okay is there any circumstance where you can use a word that is that is very offensive to others Cause that's what we're talking about even whether you mean it in an offensive context or or not so going going on so, to the n-word i yeah. was recalling a joke i remember the joke right yeah I, that a comedian used to say and I'm, i just remember the joke off the top of my head about a week ago mm -hmm. and i remember when I remembered that joke, it was by, uh, by Richard Pryor. He used to, he liberal used to the N-word. He can't yeah, yeah. He's a black guy, right? Or he was a black guy. And he, a black comedian. And I remember, 
I used to tell that joke. Mm. We're only talking 10, 15 years ago. Uh, 15 years ago, maybe, or beyond. But I could tell that joke, but say in the word, because it's in the joke. I didn't yeah, be an issue. Yeah, yeah. Now, no, no, no issue form. No, you can't. There's no way to use it. Yeah, but even though you're not using it in an offensive way. So I think that what people resist is evolution and evolution of culture and evolution of how we use language. And I think that I can remember in the 80s conversations happening around the n-word oh you can't use that anymore as if people were being oppressed by not in the 80s in the 80s yes oh, you, oh so, back then you oh, heard yeah, that. You're yeah, close yeah. Too young then. Okay, right, yeah, yeah so i can remember those conversations and to go exactly back to you know the, the, that word you were saying now and i'm going to relate this back to <laughs> did you not want to say the word <laughs> No, I'm wrong. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I wasn't forcing you. To actually, say, yeah, no. Actually, do you know what? It's not even on my. It's not even. It doesn't even. Like, I'm not, it's not in your black book. It's, it's no. not even, hey, can't say that. <laughs> so, um, so like, so I was, uh, I was, um, so like going back to the thing about mockery, right? About part of how we communicate. So this has become a huge part of my workshop works that I do with uh, with uh, with kids because when I when I teach poetry I do as I teach it as a form of well-being as a uh, as a way of looking inward and bearing witness to ourselves so for, uh, as a form of introspection and one of my one of the first things I say is that one of the biggest loads of bullshit ever said in the universe was sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me I mean for me it's like I mean like we've been killing each other over religions uh, for thousands of years every single every single all, like every single one of our major belief systems comes from poetry, comes from the written word. In the beginning, there was the word, and the word was God, and so it was written. You know, Hitler, Hitler seduced a nation with with memes, basically. Do you know what I mean? I mean words, and never more so. Like language is the most powerful weapon in the world. What like, What you mean? Is, what you mean with memes, Hitler? With yeah. Memes. So like, it was uh, so basically slogans, slogans, okay. slow slogans. So like so, so um so. Like once we accept that words have power to shape how we believe, what we believe, and to shape our attitudes, and they do, because that's how propaganda is made. That's everything's written that we like, you know. And once we accept that, and, and then you know, like um, then once we accept they have power to seduce, to hurt, to 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 to, to marginalise, then we ex we accept that. Now, okay, so we all we're all individuals with different backstories and we have different contexts and are triggered in different ways. Now, for me, I think that, and, and again, I don't, I don't hold that anything that I say is, is, is right. It's just where my story has led me to. And, and my story has led, like, look, like, um, for years I've been given p workshops on how to, how to uh, write poetry and they've been very funny and it's been all about two things firstly I get them the first thing I get them to do is I say right I want you to imagine you're about to marry to a bunch of lads I want you to imagine you're about to marry you're about to marry Margot Robbie okay and she can't seem to keep her t-shirt dry on this chilly day because she was just, um, just she was just fighting with Megan Fox who can't get out of her nurse's outfit because it's two sizes too small and it's plastic and uh, and they were fighting over who would have the right to marry you and the fight has gone on for so long they've called it a draw so they're going to share you forever on a yacht in a country too hot for clothes in an ocean of beer. And the sky is sky sports. At the <laughs> wedding, all of the bridesmaids are topless skateboarding nuns from Buenos Aires. Uh, you are the man. You're about to exchange vows. You hear a screech of brakes. In comes the biggest dickhead in town. He comes in. He headbutts, he headbutts your grandfather. Then he snogs your dad, who's kind of into it because he's a powerful, commanding, but tender kisser. And then he nicks your brides-to-be, who ditch you at the altar. On the way out the door, he shoots your dog, right? So... And, uh, and then he feeds it to his cat. Well, I want you to write down everything you're going to do when you catch him. What are you going to do? So this is to prove to you all. I'm going to prove to you all you all love writing. And now the lads are tearing into it. Because lads, by the way, lads, lads, whoa. Okay, lads, um, one rule here. You're not allowed to do anything to his mother, his sister, to his, you know, like, you know, uh, like to any women, just to him. And they're like, oh. <laughs> And I say to them, lads, I say, lads, so today you can write about whatever you want. The, the idea is they're going to treat you like adults and they want you to act like it. And so uh, I said, now, most girls are brilliant at being treated like adults, but lads, when I say you're going to write about whatever you want, that is not an invitation to write about what you're going to do to each other's mothers, because that doesn't happen in the real world. That only happens in your browsing history, okay? So <laughs> if you like a girl, write something worshipping, it will probably get you further. And um, that's the only thing you can't write is anything racist or homophobic, you know, because it's barbaric, you know, it's like or trans, or anything that hurts anyone else. 
And uh, so that gets them warmed up. And the next one is to get their opinions engaged, get them thinking. So this is where I do an exercise on, on men and women. Because there's no greater conflict in the world than, like, you know, from, from the moment we hit puberty. Maybe even young, younger, actually. My, my son goes, Dad, Daddy, we don't like girls. It's like, he's four. We don't like girls, Daddy. Boys are much stronger than girls. You know, like, you know, as, as Robin runs rings around him. And, um, and so the next thing I say is, okay, we're going to talk about men and women. And, uh, and um, so and I say, this, this is actually, um, this is going to be, uh, this used to be about romance, but I had to knock it on the head because, you know, when it comes to teenage, when it comes to men and romance, I think men have the same relationships with our emotions as women have with their farts. We experience our, ro our, our emotions with, with shame. We experience our, pri our, our farts with pride. Women are the same with their farts. Women, they, they pretend they don't do them. You know, like men would be like, pull my finger, lift up the leg put a flame to it, do you know what I mean? We're like mixed martial arts, like, do you know what I mean? Whereas, I like what girls would be doing, sneaky. When a, when a man gets emotional, he's kind of like, you know, and when a woman... Smiling, just grinning away. Yeah, yeah, like, like you know, yeah, he's kind of grit, gritting his teeth. A, a woman farts, she's kind of like just craning her neck a bit, and they do these snaky drive-bys, and, you know, no one ever knows it was them. And I think, I think it's the same with... I, so, I think so when men hold in all their emotions and when it comes out, it comes out in these bursts of rage, like, you know. And what I put it down to is, like, there's so much shaming going on right now of everyone's behaviour. If you're different to me, I'm going to shame you, right? Then that's, that's not going to end well for anybody. Do you know what I mean? Shame does not do anyone any... Like, you know, particularly the lack of dialogue. And... Oh, and one of the things that I think is that... Um, is that, like, a... You know, when we talk about, like, like a, a big part of my thing is, is, is treatment of women, how we treat women, how we treat each other, and it always has been. And, and it's always been, like, a, it starts off with the, with, with the, uh, with the um, question, okay, like, what is the most common bit of graffiti in a boy's school? <laughs> now, so, I know, I know if I'm in a mixed school, I'll say, lads, girls, be quiet, I want you to listen to the answer. And they all, the lads all go... Big, sir. And they're all really, they all, I mean, they can all be there half asleep. Like, I, I can walk into a narcoleptic class, right? And as soon as they say, what's the most popular bit of graffiti in a boys' school? It's instant engagement. Like, like, like it's as, as if all of a sudden education is fixed. At last, a real teacher talking dick, deploy male brain. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, and like, when I used to give these workshops online, I could have no, no conversation at whatsoever in the, in, the, uh, in the Zoom chat. But as soon as I say, what's the most popular bit of graffiti in a, in a boys' school, the Zoom chat starts raining penises. There's every word for a penis. There's every euphemism. There's every slang word. There's, 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 there's like strong arm emojis. There's flutes, carrots, aubergines. There's the entire brass section, actually. You know, and... Uh, and and then when I'm in girls' schools, they'll say, girls, be quiet, lads, what's the most popular bit of graffiti in a girls' school? What do you think they say? You ask the boys this? Yeah. What the, it, the most popular bit of graffiti in a girls' school? Hearts. That's the answer, but it's not what boys say. Boys go. Oh, well, I'm a boy. I know, yeah, but, uh, yeah, but you're also, you're also 40, <laughs> 40 years of age. 15-year-old boys go, dicks, sir. They go, no, they don't draw dicks. The <laughs> And they go, tits, sir. They go, they don't draw tits. Well, is that just, genuinely, well, the, yeah, this is is that true, genuinely the common answer? Well, 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 so it's vaginas, sir. They go, vaginas? And they go, so, do you think girls have vaginas? They're too difficult to draw. Well, well, that's, what do you mean, sir? Well, you know, lads, those pixelated things from the internet, depending on your internet connection. <laughs> I said, no, no one draws vaginas. Like, you know, like, and the answer is hard. Now, the funny thing about the dick drawing was I've done some research in this because when I was given online workshops, I've got a green screen behind me. So I have all these, like you've got here, I press a button and different media comes up. You've seen it. So, like, the dick drawing, right? So before language, when you've got cave drawings of like man, like stick man running after antelope with spear in the middle, penis, right? But the one we know and love, you know, the dick drawing, the guy, you know, bam, 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 you know, he's the guy, he's kind of the space rocket version that we all know with the, with the cross at the helmet, you know, that guy, he's first found. That logo for the penis is first found in ancient Greece, right? That exact same one. Do you know where he's also found? He's also found, well, 
The Mars Space Rover 2 has drawn him on the surface of Mars. <laughs> we are talking about some of the greatest minds in astrophysics, right? Commandeering multi-trillion dollars. You are dollar. kidding me. I am not kidding you, right? Come, look it up. Now, it's not a very good one, but it is the one. Yeah. Dick drawing Mars. Look it up, right? No, pe people won't be able to see this. But yeah, we're like, like making right an executive decision, right? An, ex an executive decision. Oh, Mars. You know, like, <laughs> sir, we have an opportunity here, sir. That's right, Captain. That's one small dick for a man. One giant dick drawing for mankind. Yeah, they have as well. Yeah, they have his trip. You're destroying my browser history <laughs> yeah, as well. So, I've got my browser history. So, I got dick on I'm, Mars. <laughs> I know, so like so. It's oh there, no, yeah, it's there. Yeah, yeah so like so. Look at that. So, so, that. so, so when people say like, like when people say when people say um, sort of men are always thinking with their dicks. It's like well. We're drawing dicks on Mars. I mean, in, we're drawing dicks in space. Before we get there, we've got a dick drawing. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, so like, so, and where this observation came from was, I was when I was cycling around America in 2000 to promote my first book, I was cycling with Brian, who's gay. We went to Gay Pride San Francisco. And Brian, and like, now I've been to lots of gay prides because I've always had lots of gay friends, but Gay Pride San Francisco was next level. You know, it was quite naked. There was quite a lot of swing, swinging Mickeys everywhere. Some of them were pointing, and I was a little <laughs> bit outside my comfort <laughs> at me. <laughs> so I was a little bit outside my comfort zone, and Brian could see this. And he just laughed and said, "Look, man, that's just men for you. We just sexualize everything." I was like, "Yeah, I don't go around getting it on with girls in the street." And he was like, "That's because girls won't let you. If they did, you probably would." He said, "So I was like, yeah, I suppose you." And this is just an un 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 unfiltered expression of male sexuality. And I and I remember going right to schools schools then and noticing. Like God, I was saying, lads, write about whatever you want. Guys are writing about writing each other's mothers. Girls are sluts, and they were drawing dicks everywhere. I'm looking at what girls are writing about. They're writing about finding the one he or she left me, and they're drawing hearts everywhere. And I remember, just remember going, in this world that slut shames women, I can see no evidence of it. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, we just live in a world where if I'm with 25 women today, I'm a legend. If girls are with two boys this week, they're sluts. So that's the, that. That's always formed a huge part of this workshop, where I get them thinking and like about how about about the words we use and our attitudes towards each other, and also listening to our stories, because like I, for me, and this this to, to loop back to mockery as a form of male communication in, in ireland they call it slagging right and if you can't take a slag in wales as well wales. wait it's called slagging as well is it yeah i think i think it's a common across the uk actually. is it okay it's okay slagging, okay yeah. so so like so and and i remember my wife said you can't take a slag and i'm going no i can't i really can't i've never been able to and i started noticing over the last few years when i'm going into boys schools when i'm your age when i was living in a children's home and it was a tough place to live you know it was like you know you know it's you know it's a it's a baptism of fire be like you know growing up in care you do come across levels of stuff that's a bit more real i think and you know lads going around acting tough all the time but as you probably know men who experience violence don't go around acting t hard like because it's a tra the reality is traumatic you know and and um and so when not, I was with your age, the, not with the room of the general population anyway yeah exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> try walking into three powers lines or any know, any yeah. infantry units lines mate you'll find some people walking around acting hard there. oh i'm sure yeah <laughs> but are they the toughest man in the unit possibly you got it's a different environment though you got yeah, to think yeah. everyone this is an it's an interesting thing i realized you know uh, uh, a couple of months back it's like you you if someone goes you go and exp well your past experiences growing up very very wildly different and you, you've mentioned violence and things like that to most other people yeah so so it's something that is of interest and you can talk about to people and they'll have an interest you can communicate and try and understand it and, and yeah, understand your emotions yeah. when you go so for example afghanistan yeah or any, anywhere anywhere not afghanistan anywhere a unit of 12 people 30 people 500 people goes out they all get in a battle big battle for maybe it's the first one first time i've ever been in a battle Ooh. and they all come back in everyone's experienced the same thing where's your outlet there's yeah. no process it process in it well there's some process in it internally but there's no and especially in a male environment yeah so there's no there's no outlet or there's less understanding and if and it's normalized instantly because everyone's yeah experience the same thing so instantly that becomes normal okay what was wild about it nothing especially if we go and do it the next day or the next hour again and again and again yeah, and again yeah yeah
Well, it's interesting because because you know what he said, normalizing it as well was 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 on the slag thing. What I say to lads is, I say, you want to hurt me when I'm 16, 15? Don't hit me. I'm violent, like I said, like you know, I've got loads of scars. None of them hurt. They've all got good stories. What I never got over is when I was 13, and a, and a girl I won't, won't mention her name because she might listen to it. But a girl I was at school with, when I got her friend to tell her I liked, to turn around in front of the whole class and going, "You think I go out with you? You fat ugly Irish pig? I wouldn't go out with you if you're the last man on earth. Oh my God, you've been God's gift to women. Actually, you're just speaking." I, was, I swear, I didn't ask another girl that I was about 35, man. Do you know what I mean? And, 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 and like, you want to hurt me, slag me. Because what slagging does to me, I'll wear my macho face. You won't say, hey! But what's going on behind that is the little voice that tells me they're going to find me out. They're going to realise I'm not as tough as I think I am. They're going to realise that I, I, I am sad sometimes. They're going to realise that, that behind this laugh is, you know, is... And so for me, right, look, look, as I've been giving these talks, when I go into a room there and I used to think that not being able to take a slagging was a weakness because we're taught that, we're taught you should be able to. But then when I, when I walk into a bunch of lads and I say that and I just see the looks on some lads as they go, thank fuck, someone's saying it to me. So I'm not on my own, do you know? And this is where I was reading a book by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and she's got this chapter on men which says, in fairness to men, we bring men up to believe that to be a man... They must be able to beat other men in fights. They must be able to sleep with lots of women whenever they want. They must have expensive cars. They must, and she lists off all this stuff, and, and, and she says, she says that they must be emotionally bulletproof was the big one. And, like, and I remember reading it and going, like, fuck, behind this idea of the big, tough man is, she said it denies us the vulnerability of our humanity. And I remember reading it and going, like, like for me, I, I think... One of the biggest weaknesses we have as you know as men sometimes is this culture that our vulnerability is weakness because when we experience it we experience it with shame we don't inhabit like so i was watching a movie called judas and the black messiah about fred hampton a black panthers leader and he's in this room with all these african-americans and, and this guy's hitting on this girl and she goes get off me man i i told you i told you i'm not interested in your man he goes well fuck you bitch you ain't and he starts your man fred hampton comes over and knocks him off his chair and goes any of you brothers disrespect the sisters, you ain't no better than a white man calling a black man an N-word. But I remember looking at that and going, wow, at what point did disrespecting women become a measure of masculinity? Because it's definitely there in our culture now, in certain elements of pop culture. And, you know, and, and, uh, and, and also thinking, do you know what? If I am not empowered by my vulnerability, right, when I'm rejected... Rather than just going, shit, and just, it, 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 what I will do is I will try and create a reflection of vulnerability that I am. We've got this thing, I don't give a fuck, mate. I'm not, you know, but in actual fact, it, like, like, for me, right, this, to go back to the uh, Hmong thing, actually, cause, and, and, and to link it as well, actually, to that story I told you about on the train, right? That's the, we get to Prague, right? And when we got to Prague, I had this story behind me of, this is the poet that fought off the few train robbers. It was pure Jason Bourne, man, for about three seconds. You're like, it was like it was a cabin. And it was just, and you're arriving at an arts festival. It's all pure darling, darling. You know, the idea of like this was like so, and I'd, bat, I'd scars on me from it. You know, I'd cut knuckles and stuff like that. And, and I started having this, I, I'd say it was a romance, but it was more of a bromance than a romance with this Czech girl. And we had a kiss on the first night and she said, look, I'd love to come back, but I'm working early in the morning. I'm an au pair. I look after two children and, and, and they're gone early in the morning. So I said, so, so I'd like to see you again. She said, well, I'm actually looking after the kids 24 seven, but you can come and have lunch with us. Come, come visit me. So next day I went to visit her and she looked after these two severely disabled children, one of whom did not have the mental capacity to be able to breathe. So she had this device on her the whole time. She was about, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And whatever it was, I would, I, I would like wake up after partying every day with a hangover like I was waking up in the middle of brain surgery, you know, and I'd drag myself over to where Nadia worked. And me and this kid, man, I don't know, man, I like, fell in love with her or something. She just gazed at me, like, and just like, and, every, and then I'd get back at five, six o'clock to where the lads just started drinking for the show, and they'd be like, um, they'd be like, um, like, you know, they were slagging me going like, uh, oh, he's going off getting the ride every day. And I was like, yeah, and eventually I just went, you know what, I'm actually not getting the ride. I told her, you know, what I'm doing is I'm hanging out with these two kids. It's really wholesome. It's really, it's so far from a fight on a train. Mm -hmm. And the lads start, uh, they, like, so they then gets to the lads and the lads start slagging me about it. They go, ah, see, Jason Bourne by night, man. Florence Nightingale by day. And what do I do? Well, I do what we do as men quite often, right? And, um... I make a disablest joke straight away. I make a, yeah, well, I can't remember what it was I said. And one of the lads just turned around to me and says, uh, 
You do realise my, my sister has special needs, don't you? Well, oh, man, sorry, I'm only fucking around, man. I'm only like, you know, he's like, no, nah, man, I know you don't know what they're saying. Lads never do, he says, but this, you know, when you've met her four or five times, man, and she fucking adores you, man. I'm like, oh, here. Okay, right. Now, uh, you know, now I can see her. And, like, you know, I can, you know, and now I'm like fucking feeling shit. Like, you know, and he says, Worst thing about it is, man, is you're absolutely fucking beautiful with her, you know? I'm like, oh, fuck. I've got me pint and me fucking fight on the train story and me lad mask on. And the human being behind that mask is, is drowning in tears, you know what I mean? And, and, like, and now, now I tell this story, I told, first told this story, I was giving an online workshop to 150 students and the lad sent me a joke, both joking about domestic violence. You know, like, and, um, and, you know, like, and it was a joke I'd heard before, and, like, and it was a one-liner, like, like, you know, and, uh, like, he, like, like, he sent it to me, and I'm just like, I'm funny about jokes about beating women, because my father beat my mother. I don't like it. My I don't know if they're memories or dreams I have about being locked in a bathroom, and my dad being outside banging on the door. I don't know, I, can, I, I know I have nightmares about it, like, you know, but I, just, I don't have many more I used to, so... I read it out to the whole class and I said, look, man, I said, I, I want to read your name out and shame you, but I can't because I am you. You think I've never said a homophobic joke, a racist joke, a sexist joke, a misogynist joke? And then I tell that story about Niall and being on tour and telling that joke. And I said, I said, I've been telling those jokes all my life because it's been an easy way for me to, to deflect from the fact that I can't take them myself. I can't take them. But I said, uh, I said, um, like, uh, you know, like, um, like that moment when he held that up to me, right? Like that moment of being in the classroom and reading the poem by the kid who, who, with dwarfism about his experience of dwarfism and then seeing a joke that I would not have triggered me at all until I read your man sing. That moment of, like, we run away from that and we try and deflect it, but that's a moment of awareness, a moment of growth, I think. I think it's a moment where we grow a bit. And, like, and it's a moment where we grow a little bit better. And evolution don't happen in the comfort zone, you know. And I had another moment. Like, so my whole workshop this year, they've changed into this thing whereby I've discovered, I've, I've learned to cope with my own sensitivity because I've learned to become empowered by my vulnerability. So when I feel like I fail, when I feel like I've been rejected, I own it and I don't feel like it's going to crush me or kill me, you know. And now, and so I was, I was given a workshop on this, in a, on vulnerability in a, in a big tough school in Dublin. It was the week my dad died. And like, and I had about a hundred, about 80 lads in the class. And, you know, and they were, they were amused by me. I had funny jokes, etc. you know. And then when it came to the t chat about like, you know, about uh, vulnerability. Now, firstly, we were talking about Andrew Tate. And I said, does he look happy to you? And they were like, so how many Bugattis do you have? And I was like, lads, I can't tell you, man. That happiness ain't made out of objects. It ain't made out of things. It's made out of people. It's made out of connections. It's made out of people that keep you from the fucking dark, man. The people that when you feel you're not good enough, they tell you you are. It's made out of love. And like, but sorry, if you got a Bugatti, you get other love of people who love what you have, not who you are. I said, like, you know, like I said, uh, I said, um, I said, uh, let me start talking about vulnerability. And they said, and I said, so what vulnerability is weakness, sir. Vulnerability is, I mean, if you're like, like I said, like, because where we're from, I said, now nah, you're talking about violence, man. I ain't talking about combat skills. Like, that's a different thing. They, you know, like, you know, like that's a reaction to, uh, that's actually a reaction to vulnerability. That's it, like, it's a reaction to, I said, it's being empowered and owning the vulnerability. I said, because, like, and anyway, they're fighting with me and it's getting raucous. And I get a, I get a text from my sister to say, from Jenny to say, dad's got into respiratory arrest. So, like, so, so I stopped the workshop. I've got the teachers on alert because we knew he was probably going to die that week. And, uh, and I called her, she said, I don't know, she said, it could be any time, we don't know, like, you know, so could be. I said, okay, I'm going to finish this workshop, so I go back in and I say, lads, so what's after happening, okay, shut the fuck up, I've got the call, my dad's going to die, I don't know if it's going to be in 20 minutes or, or 24 hours, I said, like, you know, I said, um, I said, I said, so we should go, so I said, what's the point, lads, do you know what, I'm never going to have an opportunity to talk about vulnerability at a moment like this again. And there was instant silence, all of them, buying, bang, there. And I said, uh, I said, um, I said, like, I said, I said, if we're talking about vulnerability, guys, I said, uh, I, I want you to look at me, go, do I look vulnerable? And there was instant, like, yes, yeah, sir, you look vulnerable. I said, because I am, boys. I don't know whether I'm going to burst into tears or smash shit up, because my dad was every kind of prick. 
know, every kind of villain you put it there, but he was also had this spark in him a kindness that was so kind, so warm, so, you know, so he, he could light up a room. And I don't know how I to feel because part of me says all his badness cancels his goodness, but part of me knows it doesn't. I said, so I don't know whether I'm going to smash it up or, but I want you to look at me, boys, and go, do I look weak to you? And they looked at me and were like, oh, sir, you look powerful, sir. I was like, okay, lads. I said, just, uh, some of them going, we are feeling our strength, sir. I said, okay, lads, just, just notice this moment, man. Notice this stillness. Notice how quiet the room has got now. Feel, notice how you're feeling right now, because, boys, right now I can feel all of you. I can feel all of you just crowding around me at my moment of vulnerability to give me strength, right? So notice that. Because there ain't no empathy without vulnerability. Empathy is what grows from vulnerability. And right now, so just notice who you are, because there's the men you really are. So stop pretending you don't give a fuck and not giving a fuck is a good thing. And just be the sons your mother's raised, because there's two versions of me in that story about, about the disabled joke. There's the first guy, which is the guy down the pub cracking the joke, right? Then there's the second guy, which is, which is, um, which is, now I'll turn around to me saying, the worst thing is, man, is you're absolutely fucking beautiful with her. With her. I don't know anyone more beautiful with her than you. And I asked the lads there, I said, which version is the real me? Well, the second version, so you're, you're, you're not, I said, lads, that's all of us, man. We're all the second version of that man. But you know what we do with him? We tell him he ain't man enough. He's got a man up. We slag him. He can't, you know what I mean? We do that, you know, and, and um, I think like, um, you know, like when we talk about strength and how we define it and bravery, one of the bravest men I know is, is, is a friend of mine's partner who is a very effeminate gay man, went to an officer's military school in the south of England, came out when he was 13, said, boys, you want to talk about strength and bravery? Talk to him. Do you know what I mean? And like, we got all, and, and, and if you think about, and I always say to them, if you think about all the heroes, if you think about your friendships, you, you think about what you love about the men you love, but you, but the men you hold brotherhood with. The real bond is is vulnerability. But what you so what do you think is wrong with vulnerability now? Because the way I'm listening to you saying it, right, there's two there's two sides to it. There's acknowledging your vulnerability, vulnerability, owning it, and and not dealing with it, processing, it, understanding it, right. And the, and then there's another side which is expressing your vulnerability vocally. Right, and yeah. the, the, they're, they're two different things. I think the first one. What, so, what do you think is? So, I, I guess no. It's more. It's more about being empowered by your vulnerability. Okay. So, like, and also, also reframing it, reframing our vulnerability not as weakness, because I think one of the things that I think one of the things that we have is I think right now there's I think there's a lot of shaming going on in men right now and, and like do you know a term I will no longer use I will no longer use the term toxic masculinity won't use it not I'm disappointed helpful. you ever used it <laughs> uh, <laughs> everybody did didn't they until it's like, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I don't, like I, I, many other things it's well I, I think toxicity exists in culture and 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 also well actually to go back to my dad actually right the villain of my story right is that well, it's the, the sorry the toxic the, the thing with toxic masculinity, right? Is the the way it's used in most of the time is in a way that it's it is uh, masculinity is toxic. Not there is a toxic version of masculinity that we shouldn't have. It's used in the first, which is Ooh. to insinuate that masculinity isn't a necessity. Well, so like which is wrong? Yeah, yeah. No, I think for me, what it is is that is that there are narrow definitions of masculinity that exclude the full spectrum of male identity. And I'm not just talking about gay and straight here, I'm talking I about... I think there's a scientific version, isn't there? But there's also people's understanding of it, which is very subjective. Very subjective. Is there a scientific... Yeah, there is. There's a def well, uh, hang on. A definition of it. Do you know what I'm thinking of there? Is that like, is that, uh, do you know, like... It, um, it's the opposite of femininity. It's the opposite. You think yeah. femininity, you think uh, a a... A person who exhibits traits that are c that are consistent with females, with what fe generally females would exhibit. Mm -hmm. And masculinity is a person who exhibit traits that are consistent with what a male human would exhibit yeah. generally. So I think that like, ex you can have a person with a very feminine walk. You can have a person with a very masculine walk. What's wrong with those types of masculinity and femininity? Yeah, no, just different things. Yeah, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't dispute that at all. Um, but Same in language. 
What I do think is that I think that our definitions of masculinity have culturally come to reject some of our most, some of masculinity's more salutary and honourable aspects and characteristics, like brotherhood, like mm-hmm. for like like, uh, like um, chivalry, like, like the parts of it that, that that is that is based on awareness of others. Do you know what I mean? And and I think there's a thing of like of you know this idea of like like um, I wrote a, like a, a poem years ago about uh, I did this thing with this Czech artist and it was it was the langu- language used to describe women in religion, um, pornography, pop lyrics, and uh, and art. And the art was generally quite beautiful. Uh, although obviously pop lyrics are art, but the pop lyrics, hip hop and stuff was pretty misogynistic, very misogynistic in a almost kind of stupid way. No more bitches, I'm okay, yeah, bye. Um, the bi- the religious stuff was pretty insane. I mean, like, but like, but some of the pornography stuff. Don't get me wrong, my browsing history ain't no gospel, but like, uh, but some of it is some of the language is so, you know, like, um, it's it it it, it glorifies. Uh, be quite violent, you know what I mean? Some of the language of porn, not porn itself, but not the, the visuals. I think, you know, like, uh, go on. On the music side, yeah. do you think that it's a question of uh, a perception of the language being very derogatory to women if you are perceiving it from a different culture that wrote the music, for example? So in hip-hop, the language used, that language is very commonly used in the culture, you know, mm. calling a woman a bitch, right? That has much less intensity and significance behind it if it's in uh, i don't know if it's in gang culture for example being just not gang culture but black culture yeah i'm generalizing you a real big generalization but in uh yeah the the word bitch is definitely used more frequently in in very much the same way that i mentioned the word mong earlier right the word mong is i'm assuming it still is now thrown around a lot it just generally in language in right in my military background yeah yeah, but it's 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 like a word that has no, it's, it doesn't mean, it's no intent, it's not like an insult. It's not like, it's, it's, it's the difference between the word, the C word and the fuck word. Yeah. Like, but if you were to be a civilian, for example, yeah. peering into the language of the military culture, you'd be shocked. You'd probably be shocked every day and go, oh my God, this language is crazy. In the same way that when we listen to a hip hop song, which is particularly, sounds particularly derogatory to women just because of the language being used, not necessarily the context being used, but words being used to describe women, bitch, we perceive yeah. it in a much more offensive way than it is being used within that culture. So I think there's an issue of, of uh, I think that, like, I mean, I think with, I think with certain cultures, treading carefully here, <laughs> with certain cultures, could really ask questions about their attitudes towards gay people and women. And I think hip hop culture is one of them. And you could go broader than just hip hop culture. I mean, like, I mean, like hip hop culture, you know, like 80s, 80s and like, you know, I mean, I don't know if you know, 99 reasons, but a bitch ain't one. Do you know what I mean? I got like, you know, like, um, I remember having a conversation with a teacher about, like, about language. And she said, like, she said, she said, uh, no one really talks about the experiences that young women go through these days. She said, like, you know, she said, uh, a young woman basically starts to develop at, you know, as a child. You know, they're as young as eight and nine these days. You know, all of a sudden they're a child with boobs. You know, and the world changes. All of a sudden, men are sleezing at them. All of a sudden, they're getting comments about their anatomy. They're switching on the TV. The media is at war against their body shapes. Their sexuality is slut shamed. Mm. They're switching on headlines. They're reading. They're reading everything, like you know, from sexual violence, domestic violence, women getting killed by their partners, and every icon they have is an object of sex, completely sexualized. Their children, like like cars are beeping their horns. Men old enough to be their dads are leering at them, you know. Like um, and then these days, the media that that um, that that um, you know young fellas engage with, and everything from Andrew Tate, to, you know, to some of the, like you know to the language, like like once you're aware of it, once you look at it, kind of look like like a like a because I remember doing that thing on on, like, on on the language of porn. Some of it's you know it's mad, like you know. She said, if you, she said, if you, like, she, uh, and she said, she said, uh, she was talking from her own experience of growing up. She said, like, she said, uh, she said, um, whether I'm your equal or not is not the point. I'm definitely not your dog, so whose bitch am I? And she said, in this world that is politically correct towards so much, why are the words bitch, slut, and whore holds? And I was like, okay, good point, actually. If we're going to apply those rules, 
like and but I do think that, that like that there's like like you've met my mate Brian. Right, so, so, so we, Say again? you've met my, my, uh, Brian, haven't you? Yes. I mean, Brian. So, gay Brian. So, yeah, 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 gay Brian. So, 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 so Brian was a brilliant rugby player. You're like, drifting. You're drifting. oh, sorry, I'm drifting. Okay. So, 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 Brian, like you know, was a good rugby player. Like, like, um, you know, like a um, monster academy there and thereabouts. And he, he's got stories of you know, like he doesn't come across as it in any way. You wouldn't have thought Brian was gay walking in the room. Do you know what I mean? And uh, but he's got stories about growing up in a rugby culture. And every time we have little something gay, gay, and he had a breakdown because he was hiding his sexuality, and there was nothing meant by it. But the fact there was nothing meant by it does not alter the fact that you know. So he was hiding sexuality as gay, and they were p calling things gay, just like in yeah, the language. Yeah, well, that's a bit gay. Yeah, exactly. Gay as fuck. And he was. Well, he got a Prius. That's gay. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, like, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and so like so so. Prius isn't gay, by the way. What's that? Prius isn't gay. Yeah. What's, what's that? Prius. The Prius. Prius isn't gay. What's Prius? Prius. The car. Toyota oh, is Prius. Is it a gay car, is it? Anyway, I derailed that with the Prius. So, uh, so, yeah, and then so, the language barrier kicked in. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so basically, like, uh, so, uh, so I think that there's, here's the thing, right, is I think that, like, like I think if we start talk, calling everything toxic, mass, I think we need, we need to work on, 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 like, you know, just re reaffirming broadening our definitions and reaffirming some of those older values about about looking out for each other do you know like i mean I've been, because because men have got a great sense of loyalty to each other but we do struggle sometimes we got a bit more of a thing of different to me is less than me do you know what i mean like uh, like uh, and i see that a lot in schools that like you know like um if you are not this like um like <laughs> Even have this, uh, like you know, like this thing that you go into, particularly in sporty schools. Like, you know, like you're not a man if you're smart, if you're sensitive, if you're gay, if you don't play sport, if you don't like rugby, if you're not into what I'm into. You know, like you're fucking nothing. Do you know what I mean? And and I think sometimes there's these, like there's these um, these values by which we hold ourselves, or, or that we try to pretend to be that aren't true to who we were, who we really are. Like you know, like uh, like um, you know, like. <sighs> You walk into a boy's classroom and and like you know like um the smartest lads in the classroom are always marginalized kind of picked on a bit you know what i mean like you know like you know because we, we have these ideas that we can form conform I, I remember this girl i was super shit with girls but they because i was trying to get with the girls pull that mic into you what's that pull that mic so, into. so 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 like so i was super shit with girls but uh but um i was trying to i was trying to go with the girls that all the rugby guys were going into and they just there was one girl, and I remember her saying to me, like, Steve, what are you doing hanging out with them for, love? I know you're good at rugby, but you should be going to art college or drama school or something, you know. And, and, um, and I, I messaged her on Facebook about 10 years ago and went, you saw me before I had the guts to be me. Do you know what I mean? Spent all my 20s and t hanging out in nightclubs when I should have been hanging out in bookshops you know what I mean? <laughs> and readings and, like, you know. And it was this whole thing of, like, you know. And, and through my work, do you know what, I've, like, uh, that I've been doing this year, I've had so many lads in rugby schools, big ru rugby schools, come and go, thanks for saying it, man. Thanks for saying it. Because I think sometimes we're so afraid of that vulnerable side. I sometimes think lads draw dicks on walls because they find it easier to show their dicks than show their hearts. Do you know what I mean? We're so afraid of it. We're afraid of the slagging. And we're afraid we can't admit to the slagging. And then, you know, and, and, you know, and, and I don't know, have you, c can you say you've never been slagged and it's hurt? Uh, no, it's hurt. Yeah. yeah. So, so, like, yeah, so, yeah. so, and you know what? It's okay. And, and, like, and so, it's, it's being empowered by that, right? Once we're empowered by that feeling of hurt and going, I ain't ashamed of the fact of that. Like, that's just that's that's actually that 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 that, that well, that's that's just a moment of awareness. That's a, that, that that that's a part of you. It's I, it's a part of your humanity. You know, like like. I think there needs to be an evaluation step before that. What's the evaluation step? What am I being slagged for? Good point. Is there an issue and, that and, I need and, to resolve? And, and, is it a valid point I've just been slagged also, off? also, who's there? Or is it, should we water off a duck back? So, my opinion of it, or my, no, not my opinion of it is, right, my experience of slagging <coughs> is, if it's you, like, if it's, if it's, if it's my, if it's my wife, it's, if, it's, if it's people I'm close to, and there's no audience, I'm fine with it. Do you know what I mean? Because if I'm, a, if I'm hurt by it, I'll tell you. But, like, but, um, but I think we should also... When you're saying, when you're saying, when in this, when we're talking about this here, when you're saying slag, you mean um, a joking, jo a mocking, mock, jokingly mocking. Yeah, yeah. You're not a serious insult, a jokingly mocking, but about something that might be an actual, yeah, an actual, um, 
uh, attribute of yours that is exactly being picked yeah. on. okay all right got it right. so one thing i always say about let's say like look like the awareness that women have of others and you know like uh like you will hear lads make domestic violence jokes rape jokes disabled jokes midget jokes and all about like like do you ever hear women make suicide jokes which is 80 percent men you never do no, but I think not, that, go on. Go on. No, you go no, on. No, I'm not saying women don't, women, women can't out of their own way of having a dig, but like, but there is that awareness of, oh, do you know what I mean? I think as lads, I, now this is my theory on it, is that, is that I think sometimes we, I think sometimes we try and distance ourselves from that vulnerability by, like, by just trying to laugh everything off. Now, I think there's a certain amount of, now I've also got this other theory on it as well, which is that I think, like, in terms of Zen, right? Like, if Zen is about, having awareness of surroundings and being in the moment. I think that feminine energy has amazing awareness of others, but it's rarely in the moment, always catastrophizing about the past or the future. Whereas I think ma masculine energy lacks that awareness, but is right in the moment all the time, which is why we can come out with shit that hurts people quite often, because we, we're right in the moment. We, we lack that awareness, but we're right there. So that's why I think kind of like, like... Yeah, uh, I don't know, mate. I, I think I... So on the language and the... the you were talking about disabled jokes and violence and things like this. I think that the root of that type of interaction now the language has evolved, okay. the way we do it has evolved, and it's definitely been sort of uh, an exacerbation. If that's the right word, in in how of when that language or those kind of interactions, violent or you know verbal interactions, occur where they're not necessarily required for in an evolutionary perspective right but i, I think i think mean. that on the men's side that that violent so in terms of the violent side of things that is you know but locker room not locker room talk wrong expression <laughs> but you know but um boys boys talk you know boys yeah, talk, talk, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. like exactly you know like you're just talking about there banter banter yeah and slaggings and all of that stuff like you were saying predominantly revolves around like it's posturing it's it's either posturing to demonstrate or to try and up yourself in the social ladder in yeah. term, in, from the perspective of uh, sexual competition, finding yeah. a, like, competition to find a mate, right? Yeah. And then on the, like, the disabled example, maybe that's part of, again, demonstrating that you are strong, you perceive that as weak and you are stronger than that. And, so that's how I think that how that language has evolved down to sexual mm -hmm. competition, because men have different requirements to women. Mm -hmm. Women have emotional requirements. W women women have a need to find men who demonstrate mm -hmm. the demonstrate masculine traits, demonstrate um, existing or future likelihood to have access to resources that it can provide. Yeah, but then conflicting that as well, women have a requirement to find a man who is willing to share, for example, willing to stick mm -hmm. around, willing to care for their children, willing to uh, spend time out foraging and fighting and, and protecting them while they're with the, with the kids. So I think uh, my point is on the masculinity side, I think what is evident in the, a lot of the language we have that we scream at the moment or people scream toxic masculinity, it's just a demonstration of what is what is a kind of about evolutionary and a demonstration of boys, especially in the boy sense, because they still find their feet, of they're moving towards the men that need to be and realizing, okay, this is this is what women want, this is what we think will attract us to women. And, it's, and a lot of it is learned behavior, a lot of it's genetic. So well, I think those, well, am I making the right yeah, point there? Yeah, my, but my, my issue would be when we start talking in evolutionary terms is like, yeah. is, about evolution is it moves on. Yeah. And so, you know, like that's that, that's why we're not going out killing the children of the of the mates we want to, to preserve our gene pool. Do you know what I mean? Do you know, like 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 in nature, the lion will kill the offspring of its of its of its uh, of its rivals. Like you know, like there's all these like and yeah, but that's, I, uh, yeah, that's only because right. Yeah. So so even now, the yeah. same as thousands of years ago, the last stop on the journey of conflict resolution, yeah. the last stop if you get to it is life or death the last stop is lethal violence that's the yeah, last stop yeah. the only reason that it seems to be not a thing now and not not a requirement like men being physically capable is not a requirement okay it's because there's many 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 more stops in between now yeah, yeah there's more 
there's more uh, strings on the bow, there's more weapons in the army to resolve the conflict before you... And most of those are language-based. Say that again? There's more... Which bit? What you just said there, the, uh, before strings in the bow, there's more strings there's, in the bow. There, there's more stops in between... There's more stops between in the, in the journey of conflict resolution. There's more things yeah. that you can do to resolve the conflict before you get to... There's more ways you can demonstrate to the opposing party, I am stronger than you, it is not worth going further down this journey because I will beat you when we get to the last stop, life or death. But what is stronger than you these days? What how is what, define, How is strength defined now? Cause, because, because... At which I stage say, on the journey are we? Well, I think in terms of <laughs> evolutionary terms, right? I think in terms of evolutionary terms, like, um, like um, you know, I think that a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, 700 years ago, maybe, physical strength was really important to get your position within within a societal group now it's intellect it's intellect and drive well, well physical strength is still important it's much less important it's important for entertainment and war but it's not but 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 but, but, but you, uh, like you're not going to be able to put f like as much food on your table by lifting things as you will by sitting at a computer selling shares no so what but, it means so no but the richest men of the world are not the physically strongest men of the world see what i mean so the men with the most power in the world are not the men with the, that they're not the most violent and most and most physically strong. No, but it doesn't. But that doesn't help you in a in an individual conflict, does it? When you're trying to protect your wife. Yeah, but the reality these days of individual context trying to protect your wife is not it's not a day-to-day -day reality so that's what i'm talking about there's more steps okay. on that so, journey to conflict resolution right? yeah so like so so by the same juncture right so, so by the same juncture um so our measures of strength and our definitions of strength are broader than just than just physical yeah so and our measures of courage are broader than just you know, putting one's life in a moment in danger, you know, like it can be... There's be more measured. ways to demonstrate value. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think also, like, uh, our definitions of lots of things uh, are broadening. So, like, so, so you know, like... like um, and I think that the conversation around... I think the conversation around... Uh, is, part of this is... The conversation around you know around our relationship with vulnerability and being empowered by it sorry <laughs> keep talking the mic. <laughs> can you mix this right can you no, it's just, right. okay so so part of it can be about this adhd me yeah. <laughs> can be uh, like you know like um you know our relationship with with our vulnerability because i mean definitely i think um i think like since I've only got this, I've just got this back from kids as well and from lads and just, uh, just uh, almost like when you have conversations with lads and you see, you know, like, I mean, I've got this thing of saying, like, lads, that macho armour is beautiful. It's great crack for the sports room. It's great crack for the, uh, it's great crack for the, um, it's great crack for the, for the battlefield. It's great crack for the banter, but also weighs a ton. And if it crushes that vulnerable part of you, if, if, if it makes you suppress that vulnerable part of you, don't hold if you experience vulnerability uh, you should experience your vulnerability as a strong as you do that side of you because you we are all going to experience vulnerability and when we do if we're empowered by it we're not going to hide it we're not going to suppress it we're not going to uh, you know like because because if you look at you know if you look at the um if you look at the you know, the mental problems that men have. You look at the tragedy around men these days and, like, the you know, suicide rates, etc. you know, and there's very few people these days of our age, you know, who don't know a hand, at least a handful of people, you know, who they've lost. And, you know, and, you know, I'm just hypothesizing, but, for, like, for me, since I stopped experiencing vulnerability with shame and as weakness... My, like I'm like my own my own you know mental health struggles have been and since I've started sharing it and and, and sharing it with all you know like um I've, since I've started becoming empowered by it it's also it, it it's given me an awareness of others that I never had before um and but I also think that like I, like I was reading this this uh, writer Brené Brown 
and she was talking about giving a thing about vulnerability and shame and this man came up to her kind of tearful getting to sign her book and said and said um she said uh he said thank you your talk was amazing he said look i liked everything that you said but she said he said you know you talk about vulnerability and the power of it but as a man the moment i'm, I'm vulnerable you don't want me and she said she was just stopped in her tracks and she was like yeah she said he just he just knocked me for six because we don't talk about it we reject I'm male t- vulnerability i'm strain i'm i'm struggling to uh, find the le- uh, like understand you not yeah. understand, it's not find a lesson like I, I need can we focus on the give me examples give me some examples of the vulnerability you're talking about and how that can be sensitivity basically sensitivity yeah, but give me give me some examples oh, because oh. when i'm when you're talking about vulnerabilities right the advantages yeah. i'm seeing of of accepting the vulnerability is that that should be something that i if i can work and i work on it to reduce the vulnerability that's how i'm looking at this mm-hmm. um so actually no, or, it's, mm. or be able to or be able to accept if i can't if it's something that i can't change or shouldn't change then accepting it and be able to live my life in the positive way with it knowing that it exists and that's who i am say that again so if i can't change it or improve it and and reduce that vulnerability or eliminate that vulnerability that yeah. i have in whatever way man i'm obviously not talking physical i mean like an emotional vulnerability we're talking about right yeah then if i can't then it's learn to accept it and be able to work through life in a way that i can do positive positively um and it doesn't and that and i don't let that vulnerability prevent me from doing anything that i can i should be able to do i can do so right so yeah it's about how we frame it to ourselves and experience it because and it comes down to I, the message is quite simple or, or, or the message that i would give is quite simple or that i would hypothesize over which is that you know this idea that vulnerability is weakness is what causes us to experience it with shame if we if if we experience our vulnerability with power as you know as as, as an experience that we, within which we grow we don't shrink from vulnerability. We're empowered by it. And that's where empathy comes from. Because I, I, I actually think that a hell of a lot of it comes down to, like, you know, I think that, um, like, I think, like, I think that empathy, like, like, I think if you're empowered by your vulnerability, you're empowered by your vulnerability. Give me an example of a vulnerability that you've worked through. This is what I'm struggling with. Oh, the concept. any vulnerability I, I've worked through? Yeah. Give me an example. Well, I've given you loads. Like, so, like, so, for example, can't take a slagging. Can't take a slagging is one. I'm bipolar as well, That's which a is a pretty big yeah. one, you know. So, you know, and, and let's say, for example, like, 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 like I've, I've been off to drink this year because I'm trying to, you know, like, because I've noticed how, you know, it makes me manic and then I hit these, these I, I, I go into dangerous levels of darkness. The amount of lads that you say to, the amount of men that you say to, um, the, where you say, Listen, I'm not drinking. No, I got like, look, I'm bipolar. I go to, ah, you sure everyone's, ah, he's not drinking. And they mock you for it. And that happens. You get yeah, that mock you. Yeah, culture thing. Yeah. You know, like, so, you're like, you're like, so, like, so, so, ah, look, like, and it's that. That's exactly so what I'm talking about. Why are you not using the word weakness? You're describing weaknesses here. Why don't you, why aren't you using the word weakness? Um, so, vulnerable. Because not being able to take a slag in is a weakness. No, that's, no, they're two different things here. Okay. Vulnerability right, go on, I'll ask so, him, do you want? So, like, so, 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 <laughs> so, vulnerability is a susceptibility to danger. Weakness is an inability to cope with it. Weakness is a lack of strength. Vulnerability itself is a, is a susceptibility to danger. That, but by definition, Okay. So if you're vulnerable, yep. you look like, look like there is a possibility of danger. So if you're empowered by it, you witness it and you know where it is. Do you know what I mean? And so like, so, so, so your ship is vulnerable at the hull, you strengthen the hull. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, so, so you recognize, so within yourself, you recognize your triggers and also, but it's also self-awareness. Self-aware, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so also, I also think that there's a thing, and, I, and I, this is, this is from my own experience of who I, you know, like, of, like, I remember like, what did I say to lads, you know, when you slag someone too hard and you see it hurt them as a kid and you, and you go home and you think about it and you go, fuck it went too far there. Do you know what I mean? Like we've all done it. Like, you know, 
that moment of like you know and i said like you know so the, the moment when you're with the lads and i think like actually do you know i do this thing i said like like um i do this thing do you know i said earlier on that i think um, most I, I think most lads hated women because they'd never seen anything positive in the classroom because i say lads you're not allowed to say anything physical but i wanted to read out five things you like about women and they go what do you mean physical i said you can't say tits and ass lads would go sir what are we supposed to write then? And they're not even joking. Right? One lad slammed his pen down. I went, this is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, think about your mother. Okay, so, oh, like, <laughs> like you know, and, uh, but then, like, when I started giving online workshops, right, when I started giving online workshops, I'd have lads sending me direct messages of things they liked about women. And the most common answer I got was, you can be yourself around women. And for me, like, uh, I remember my 40th, my girlfriend. Oh, interesting. Interesting yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember at my 40th, uh, my girlfriend at the time. You can let your guard down. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You can stop pretending. I've never thought of that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At and that course, age. At that age, yeah. yeah and and yeah. I remember, I remember like an ex of mine, Lucy, saying to me, um, saying to me, uh, like, um, just like, she said, if a guy is a bit of a jock, you know, you're, you're a bit of a man's man. She said, you've got a lot of gay friends and girlfriends. I hadn't really thought about it. And I went, do you know what? I mean, like, actually, it's like, it's because I'm a little bit more comfortable sometimes around just being sensitive. I can be, like, you know, like, sometimes I feel like I'm pretending to be a version of me that I'm not. And it's not to do, when I was 15, 16, I thought I, I, thought I was probably gay, not because I fancied men, but because I was sensitive. Do you know what I mean? And because, because I couldn't take a slag in, because, because. You thought you were gay? I thought I might be, because I was shit with girls. Like, you know, I was like, like, I, I had no confidence with girls. I, I never actually, I don't think I ever thought I fancied men, but I just thought there were so many attributes that if lads knew that I had them, they'd go, gay. Because, 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 because you must be gay if you're scared. You must be gay if you're sometimes you're confident. You must, you're not confident. You must be gay if sometimes you doubt yourself. Or that's really... an example of a word that's just thrown around as an insulting word that you don't actually mean the meaning of the word. So... And and yes, I know there's no obviously, meaning uh, in but it. I'm, you know? Obviously, you, that's not you interpreted it. I'm just yeah. It's another example of that kind of word being thrown around. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like so, 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 and again, it's all about like like I think sometimes we feel like oh, I don't mean it. It's like it's almost like stray bullets. Like I didn't mean it. Fucking don't fire the bullet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you know it's it, it's um it's like uh and I think th I think there is a line as, as well where we just say like you know like um. Just this thing that I was saying to lads about like if you're empowered by your vulnerability, when you see it in others, you won't sneer at it. You'll be the guy who, when you see someone struggling, like you know, maybe look like, seeing someone getting homophobic abuse, you go, "Come here, listen." I saw that was out of order, man. Like you know, you see a girl walking through, getting up, and lads come, like you know, being made feel unsafe, catcalling. So it could be the lad that says nothing. Lads says, "Sorry, you okay?" Like like I'm really sorry, lads. We can do better. The lads in that school said to me like, "But sore, sore." Okay, do you know, you get slagged out of it, you might do. You might get slagged out of it, but guarantee you, you get slagged out of it. Two guys will go home, like, they go, like you do when you slag someone too much, and they'll think about it. Next time you stand up and say something, another lad will stand up, then another lad. So the last man standing, mm -hmm. calling someone a faggot or a slut or a whore, is the smallest man in the room. And now you're defending masculinity, and all you're doing is being your fucking self. Do you know what I mean? Because you're just doing what... Like, the, the amount of times that growing up you don't say something and you know you should, but you're afraid of the slagging and you're afraid of like... Because not giving a fuck is a great thing. And then you get to our age and you look at the collateral damage that we were, we were never allowed to be those people. And, we, and all of a sudden at our age we start looking and going, you okay? You okay, buddy? And then you start realising that the people you love, the people you really, really count, you don't love your brothers your friends, you know, like the men in your life, you don't love them for their cars or their skin fades or their biceps. You might admire that shit. You love them for the moment they open up to you and they show you that because the bravery and the strength that that takes to do that is like, like is, is, is quite something. Do you know what I mean? Because what we're breaking from and the strength and the courage here comes from millennia of evolution where we were not allowed to. Mm. And that's where the bravery and strength is. And once we start def re defining it that way, all of a sudden we start looking around and go, do you know what? And we're just, all we're doing is, like, like, you know, and I think when we get to our age, we start to kind of, like, you know, because you, you, we, we start to see collateral damage around us, you know, and like, but I think when you're young, it's like, no one spoke to us like that growing up. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, so for me, that's, uh, 
Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's like it's something that, uh, and it's it's always evolving. You know what I mean? We always, just like then we had that moment. You said like guys saying you can be yourself around girls. I'd never thought about it. I'd never thought about it until I read that as well. And what happens is, is as we have these conversations, that's one thing that I think is just really fucked at the moment is that we don't have conversations. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You know, like, um, go on. You can be yourself around, I'm just thinking back to my childhood. Yeah. You can be yourself around girls if the girl is being okay with you. I was very uncomfortable as a kid with, around girls. Yeah, real yeah. uncomfortable. Just because I, I was just I wasn't a very confident individual. Didn't understand, yeah. didn't understand myself. I was self-esteem and all the rest of the stuff. I've I spoke about, about before on the podcast. And yet, you know the kid I knew at that age. I wished I was as confident as you. No. Yes, I shit you not. Because that's what we're all doing, man. We're all wearing that confident mask. We never show Where it. Where was that? You look at thinking of the wrong kid, mate. You should have come to school. Who... You should have come to school with me. You'd have been like, what you mean? You, mean like him. You weren't at school. You were bunking <laughs> off with me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, if you know, if if I was to walk into a room full of girls, that would be my worst nightmare. Like, yeah, oh, me too. Fucking god! But if I was to walk into a room and there's one girl there, I know her because I was in a class with her, or whatever, and I knew that she'd even just say hello to me and come, then guard yeah. down. And when you said about um, you, when you said you be yourself, I thought back to that. I literally thought back to weight lifted off my shoulders. That experience of being yeah. around. There's no boys around. There's no posture, and there's no because that's what it all is. Right? Yes, yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's just status. Bang, 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 bang. Who's who's the man? Who's the man? Yeah. Which of the groups I want to yeah. be part of? Who's not cool? Who is cool? What do the girls think of me? Who's good with the girls? And that weight gets lifted when, you, when you're not when you're not around them. Yeah, yeah, you know, if, yeah. If you're not, if you're not in that circle, if you're not in that group, if you're not the tip of the top of the tree. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, if yeah. you are, you don't have those inhibitions. Because if you did have those inhibitions, you wouldn't be the top of the tree. No, you wouldn't. No, Do you know no. what I mean? Yeah, and, but, and yet I also think that as well. It's like, I mean, like, like I actually look at the guys as well who were the guys at the top of the tree then getting all the girls. And, uh, you know, my own dad, for example, like, you know, like a, a, a famed womanizer, infamous womanizer, got loads of women died in his own lonely, and I think uh, I think that I think that those guys who who got all the things like like they're, 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 like who wear that invulnerability like that and get all the girls. There is a little bit of a paradox there as well, which is that you know we talk about vulnerability, and I always say this to like you know you know we hear all this thing about men treating um, women badly and the culture of misogyny and the glorifies treating women like shit has got to be has got to be spoken about and 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 you know wiped out. But conversely, when you hear all this shit about guys who take treat women badly, do you ever hear a woman go? Do you know what I find hot? Do you know what's sexy? Kindness. <gasps> oh my God, yeah. Kindness. Kindness would melt the knickers off you. <laughs> no, what you hear is that sexy bastard. I can change him. He was a challenge. And there is, on the one hand, you've got this culture of playboys, pickup artists, you know, like, uh, like all of that stuff. But there's definitely... I think it comes from a place of seeing good essence in people and, and seeing good in people. But there's definitely a... There's definitely a fucking, um, there's definitely also a place where, you know, like um, our culture has to start, l l l like, ha has to stop empowering those bits that are just work against us. Because actually I was talking to someone about this, about even when it comes to intimacy as a young fella, you know, when you meet someone you really connect with you know, that you really are in love with. The difference between going out and getting the ride is always brilliant, it's always great, it's always fantastic, it's overwhelming when you're young, it's, it's so intoxicating, but that moment where you meet someone that you really fucking connect with and that joyous feeling, again, it's that bit where, like, you just fucking laugh together and you're... And I still think when you're, when, you're, when, 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 when you're young, I was definitely, when I first started going out with girls, going in pretending to be this Superman lover. I'd only had about two shags in my life, didn't know what I was doing or where to stick it. You know, like, you know, whereas, like, you know, so, 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 like, you take off all your clothes, but you leave your fucking macho <laughs> mask on. Whereas, in fact, when you meet someone that you just bear everything to and your vulnerability, it becomes this joyful moment where you laugh together and... You know, like but changing that culture that you're talking about is to is to is to say that you need to change how the laws of attraction work, um, which which you don't want to change unless both sexes are equal in terms of physical ability. I don't get you there. 
<laughs> well, because the, the, so the, the laws of attraction, like Ooh. ignore all the dressing they have in today's age and fads and, uh, not fad, yeah, fads and trends and all of the rest of it, right? Um, like the laws of attraction of what we're attracted to in women generally, yeah. what we're attracted to in men, ignore the fringe attributes, yeah. right? But mainly, so women are attracted to men who are, who are able to provide for them, provide a few things that we know they're able to provide, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and, and in terms of, so that's on the baseline. And not in, in my world, actually, I'd have to say. Okay. And I'll explain why. All right, all right. So, okay, so, so well, I said women to men there, didn't I? Yeah, women to men. Yeah. So then, and so... When what they're drawn to us in terms of physically or mm. socially are all uh, mostly attributes or indicators that that signal mm. that we can provide uh, resources, protection, uh, resource and protection mainly, right? And good genetics. Okay. Right. Okay. I'll, 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 no, go, I'll, go on. Yeah, so, go on. So. From your story, that makes sense. From my story, right? Um, and this is Darwin's story. So, so <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, like, um, so, like, so, from my story, like, like, is that is is my experience? Is that is that? And and this is, you know, I've lived like I've, like, grew up in a single mother home, was fostered by a single mother, and. And also, just when I think of my friend groups as well, my social groups as well, which is that I think that so many of the women I know, like, um, they are the breadwinners in the family, do you know what I mean? And, and in actual fact, they're attracted. Like, like, and also, it I actually... It doesn't mean the same laws of attraction apply to them. It doesn't, that doesn't mean they don't. I think the laws of attraction to... And, 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 and it's not so... It's a trade-off. The laws of attraction are a trade-off, right? So, if so, if you look at an example of a, you know, generally, a, a, generally, women are attracted to me, men who have access to resources, a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. One of the things. No, no, that's not generally. That's one of the things, right? Mm. You're not exactly rich. What are the ways that some women? The classic women is are? Young, well, the classic is young, you know, women to rich men, nice car, big house, or they got a good chance of having that in the future. Do you think it but, goes the other way as well, though? Uh, it can do, but there okay. are trade-offs as well. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm only talking about your women to men at the moment. I'm conscious I'm talking men to women because it goes, it goes both ways, right? So there are trade-offs. You know, uh, if, if, there's a, if there's eight or nine of these things that women find are attracted to in men, yeah. one of those things could be shit. They could find a really poor bloke who's got nothing really attractive because all these other things are so good about him. Because it's so all the other, the, 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 the factors are so good, are so high that they outweigh everything else. Yeah, he may yeah. be skint now. Maybe, he's, maybe it's because he's got high prospect of de earning decent money in the future. Mm. Or maybe he's just a really kind bloke. Okay. He's just really generous. He's really good with the kids that you've already got and, you, and you've, you, from a previous father, but it's really hard to find a, a person to stick around, yeah. a balance stick around with someone who's already got kids, right? So it's, it's all balances. So when I'm talking about these things, yeah, I'm generalizing, but also it doesn't have to be a woman. It's not always a woman wants a rich guy who's really good at fighting, got a massive house, has got great genes, and is going to stick around and is generous. They, they all, you know. So I've got to stop you for, it's not because I'm not agreeing with you. If I'm looking uncomfortable, it's not with what you're saying. It's because no, I'm, no, I'm dying for a piss. Oh yeah. <laughs> so like two seconds. We are back. We are back with empty bladders. I feel so much lighter. Right. Oh, stop! It, I know. Can it, you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. It, it did give me a chance to uh, to think a bit through. I was butchering it then. Right. So the point I was making. I spoke this in the past. So I was talking about things generally. Why women are attracted to men? What they're attracted yeah. to? Yeah. It goes the same the other way, right? Now the so men are attracted to certain things, and women. They have different values on what's going on and they, they work up against each other. Anyway, the point I was trying to make is most of our behavior, male and female behavior these days, I think, you bumped that camera, didn't you? I'll sort that out in a minute. I think. Oh, it's good. It's another good. one behind you. The, oh, okay. the, the, most of the behavior, that we, that's not what I think it is. Most of the behavior that we exhibit has its roots in the laws of attraction. Now, it has its roots in laws of attraction. So, okay. you know, a lot of the masculine stuff, a lot of the feminine stuff, most of the stuff we say or do has its roots in, motivated by the laws of attraction, right? Most of it. But because of 
media, because of life, because of evolution, because of the way all of the, all everything of the way we live our life, what influences now, mm -hmm. some of it is pretty extreme and not necessary. Like we've evolved behaviors and things and language and, and parts of our culture that is not necessary, has no evolutionary advantage, often isn't nice or good, but okay. we do it anyway, which you've alluded to some of it. You know, we've alluded, you've alluded to some of it already. That's the point I was trying to make. So most of the laws of attraction, see, I think with the laws of attraction, I think they're so, um, you know, like, I mean, like once you talk about evolutionary laws of attraction, I think, I think it's commonly acknowledged that evil, that, that we've started, we, we've evolved in the last hundred years. We've started to evolve at a greater pace than ever before. Um, and that evolution itself has sped up exponentially. Now, I just heard that recently. Right? I don't think we have. I definitely think we have. I definitely think we I have. Think, I, think we've, I think we have technologically. I think we have socially. But I think, I think uh, in terms of our mental capability and our physical capability, that, is, that has not has evolved as fast as the things around us has have, which is why... We, but I the think things that are so the, turbulent. But the things around us are part of our evolution, our manifestations of our evolution. So, yeah. So, like, so, so, as, um, you know, so, like, so, you know, like, like, apart from our roles, you know, not just in, um, our societies have changed exponentially, our, our roles have changed, um, what governs. Our, our, our power as individuals has changed. Um, our attitudes towards each other have changed. Um, and even, even in the last, even the last, you know, I mean, like, like, I mean the last 2,000 years, three to two and a half thousand years were, you know, Western society based around Abrahamic religions, which in the space of about 20 years will almost be gone. 30, 40 years will almost be gone. There's 20,000. Uh, I see what you, know you what mean, mean now by that kind so, of so, evolution. Yeah, yeah, got uh, it. And got also, it. like, also, even if you look at, even if you look at, like, you know, the subjugation of other people, if you look at, like... As, you know, That's a cultural people. evolution as opposed to individually, as a human evolution. You're talking about cultural evolution as opposed to human evolution, same thing, evolution, though. right? All of it is the same thing. So. I don't think so, because if... No, I don't think so, because if you go and look in... No, they're not, because human evolution at the moment is exactly the same across the world, more or less, more or less, and faster in some places than others, but it's not very obvious, whereas cultural evolution in the West is much faster, for example, than cultural evolution in sub-Saharan Africa. Without the ability to be able to Google this right now and but go like... It's and cultural go, evolution. So like, so... The like, cultures of the Amazon, right? So with everything that was changed, the cultures in the Amazon rainforest right now are exactly the same as they were 20 years ago, almost. Whereas ours is vastly different. So it's cultural evolution, not human evolution. But, uh, but, isn't, but culture is a manifestation of human evolution, by definition. Culture is the way we do things and the way we behave. But when I say human evolution, I mean physically and mentally. Okay, so like so, um, physically and neurophysiologically. But isn't culture an absolute response to that? An absolute response to our mental evolution? Yeah. So you know, our so culture is a so our cultural changes and the way we evolve c c our cultural changes and cultural evolution will have an impact on human evolution. Going back to. I don't uh, just dismiss that scientific, do, 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 the do, do, scientific do, 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 point you know, I was making. Do, do you know what I mean? no, <laughs> I'm just reticent to, uh, I'm just like... I suppose just, it's the trigger for human evolution, right? Cultural evolution is the trigger for physiological evolution. Um, you see, I'm, I'm not going to comment on it because I don't know. I just don't like, I, I, I'm not going to, because until I can look at science and go, okay, what's it? I don't know what experts say on this, so I'm not going to, I'd just be bullshitting you if I... Neither would I, 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 I could have just been talking total shit now. So just, I'm just going to go on, am I going to, if I, if, if I bounce this one back, right, it's, gonna, <laughs> it's definitely like, it's, it's on a haunch that I disagree, but I'm not even sure if I definitely disagree, because I'm just going to be like, 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 you know, so... Um, but I do think that I do think the laws of attraction have changed quite dramatically, actually, because because the power because there's been a power shift in our culture, in our Western culture, culture, yeah. Western so culture, like yeah. so, I think that, and I also think that I also think that, but I also think there's there, there's different levels of feminine and masculine attraction. I often say this to to in, in, in my groups when I say like when you hear like um, like like in terms of laws of attraction, you will hear women talk about the intellect of of men 
in exactly as the same way as you hear men talk about the anatomy of women, right? You'll hear men go, she's Christ, she's, she's got a head like a pickaxe, but she's some bunda on her. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> she's Christ, and all she's because she's, she's, she's a face like the back of a train, but she's some pair of tits. Oh, you would, you would. You'd hear women, you literally hear women go like, you know, oh my God, he's really not very good looking, but he's really smart. You know, like, you know, or, or, like, you know and, and, um, and yeah but why is that though steve because i think women I, I think i actually think there is i think there is i think women are more cerebrally attracted and men are more visually attracted or yeah or it's because that when you when you weigh up the negatives and the positives of a, of the opposite sex you're willing to let something be bad if other things are really good so yeah in okay that, so in that example for the female in that example I, i'm I'm really going like a high live, high level in this. In that example, yeah, he doesn't look, uh, he doesn't look great. And the reason we pay attention to looks is because it's an indication of your how good your genetics are, likelihood of getting ill, and likelihood of doing of of of, uh, of surviving. Getting and ill and uh, it's sick, and the likelihood okay. of your offspring being sick or being healthy, right? But if that's really poor, but they're really smart, then that's an indicator that they, they are likely to do well in the future, do well meaning access to resources, being able to provide. It's a really good example of the balance. That's why we're attracted to people physically. That's, that's why we're attracted to physical people. It, it's an indication of how strong the genetics are, how likely you are to be ill, how likely you are to be around in the future, how likely the offspring are to survive. I'm not denying there's an evolutionary genetic route to this argument that is true, but, uh, but, but, but <laughs> I, I think... I, 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 Can we get back I, on the poetry? I, no, no, wait, wait, poetry. Just, one, more thing is, <laughs> one more thing I'd like to say on that, Hugh, is that like, I think we moved on to the stage now where there's more nuance to it. That's why we don't go up to someone we're attracted to and sniff their crotch. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like it's like I, I, I think we have we have like we have moved on to different things and different you know like um, and we make connections in different ways yeah. that are further away from our instincts and more cerebral now. Do you know what I mean? And, and like you know our language uh, and our ability to uh, to 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 indicate to give off signals. is yeah. very much more advanced than it was ten thousand years ago. But I think twenty thousand. Uh, I, I would hypothesize that women in general would be would be more like uh, that, that, that any guy really who makes a connection with a woman intellectually like you know like like, like, like i mean people look at sheila and go how the hell did you end up with her she's way out of your league and you know i would say to them well she's really poor eyesight and no sense of smell but apart from that they make her laugh do you know what I mean? <laughs> like you know and like and you know, we connect like that and you know and i think um I, th I also think as well that I think that, and, and, and I would go back actually this to the whole, you know, like, um, you know, the, 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 the stereotype of being attracted to bad boys is that I generally think that women are also attracted to vulnerability as well. I think they genuinely are. I think they... Some women. Yeah, well, because of empathy. Less women, women the more. Mm. Same in the bad boys. Less women the more. Um, I, again, we're talking about different things. So different, I come from an arty background and you and you're coming from a military background. I mean, so. Just to compare experiences, I, but I'm also going off. I've, I've literally yeah. done research and studying of this. Okay. Which is why I'm talking with confidence on it. Okay. So but. like, so, so I, and I don't mean I did a Google search once. I mean, I've, I've read books, read, read papers on this. Okay. Because, so. because I want to, he actually started off with. And actually, the reason I went down the rabbit hole, it actually okay. started off with the assertion that um, makeup, and the reason we, we make up is, a, is like a, a basic a cult, uh, a, um, a social construct. That was what started me down the rabbit hole. Okay. And I, okay. Thought, I don't think that's true, but I don't know, so I'm going to try and form an opinion on it by reading. Yeah, yeah. So uh, to go back to the poetry, right, so... <laughs> No, do you know what it is? Culturally or is that, physiologically? Is that, is that, uh, no, so to go back to the work that I do, right, with, uh, with, um, with so, so much of it is about just getting young men, women as well, young women as well, but, but this year so much more powerfully to work. I've been, you know, like I've been getting loads more work in boys' schools, particularly rugby schools, um, getting young men to define their own sense of self and, and masculinity or, or, or however they identify actually in terms of exactly who they are. You know, like that thing of being yourself and not trying to hide it, not trying to lock it away, being empowered by it. Like, you know, and, 
you know, and 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 also recognizing that, recognizing that, if you can't take a slag in, that ain't weakness. It's it's actually just it's just sensitivity, and that whole thing of like you know like like it's just and and once you, like basically not like a to be empowered by all aspects of their human experience. Yeah, when you were talking about vulnerability earlier, which is why I kind of asked you to, to, to go on uh, over a bit more, mm. because I, I was misunderstanding you. I was thinking you were saying um, accept vulnerability and and that is it. To be so empowered it, it, by it. Yeah, but you don't mean accept all the vulnerabilities and just that's what they are and don't try to change them, do you? Because that would be bad. So it's... it's um... Because otherwise, you would now still be sensitive to slaggings. Oh, you, I still am. Well, a no, but bit, you, yeah. you would let them. They would. They would impact you just as much as they did then. I assume they impact you less. So now. the reason they impact me less, right, is that because I'm not ashamed of being, of being triggered a bit. I'm not ashamed by it. And so if I get triggered a bit, I will go, like, like rather than you hiding my shame and it. pretending that it doesn't hurt, I go. Listen, man, sorry. Do you know what I mean? So I own it. So I'm being, I'm being more of my authentic self. Because if I'm not, so like, because, because I'm no longer ashamed of that vulnerability, vulnerability doesn't go away, but, the, but its impact becomes less harmful. Um, and similarly, when I see it in someone else, and I see someone else get, I'm like, oh, you're okay, buddy, I got you. Do you know what I mean? I'm like that too. Do you know what I mean? And like, you know, and... And I think that, you know, I've, I've, I've been in some schools, right? I'd let's go, but sort of vulnerability is weakness. And like, you're going, you're not getting it. It's like, it's not like, like, like weakness is, is, is lack of strength. Vulnerability is, is, is susceptibility to danger. So, Steve. So, go on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I keep doing it, don't I? <laughs> so we should have done this at the monitor over there. So I was looking at myself the whole time. <laughs> so like, so, so yes. Yeah, so it's, um, and just not... Like, I think sometimes as men we do, like, you know, like we, it's, it's this idea that we think we've got to be emo like emotionally bulletproof, you know, and, uh, you know, and that, uh, you know, like stuff like sadness, stuff like insecurity, stuff like lack of confidence, stuff like, you uh, know. Yeah, that's a misunderstanding. The the emotional bulletproofness, that's the misunderstanding. That's, the, the problem is there is there's an overlap with, there's, I'm going to come back to the attractiveness thing. There's an overlap with, you're not, you know, you, you wanted you not you not wanted to display you not wanted to, to display a what something that could be perceived as a weakness by either men or women, other men or women. Like mm -hmm. for, 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 and but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't that you that that you shouldn't address to your point about vulnerability. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't pick up and address and accept those emotional issues you may have mm -hmm. or emotional parts of you that may be below the average bar you know what i mean that makes so, sense uh we shouldn't accept those parts of you that are below the average do you know where i think like um how i think like um being empowered by vulnerability manifests in very real terms right is that is that i believe that when I heard, uh, when my, like my, my auntie Erst died, I heard stories, my uncle P asked me about my dad and no one spoke to him. And I heard some stories about his childhood and stuff he went through. You know, he went to an elite rugby school and he, and he was a sportsman, he was an athlete. And, you know, he had, you know, he was this guy who had this reputation around him. And then I heard about some of the trauma he went through that I'd never heard of. And the last year of his life when I looked after him, you know, like uh, he told me about some stuff he'd been through. And I kind of came to the conclusion that... Um, that I don't think when people hurt us, it's ever about us. I think it's actually their trauma pointing at us. It's their pain pointing at at someone else. I think I, I think when we hurt people, sometimes it's just clumsiness, but sometimes, oftentimes, it's because we're pointing pain at you know pain at others. You know, like bullies are not just. We love to think people are just bad. I I don't see that. I see trauma, and I think people like. And I think I think that. So, like, so, like we don't, particularly as men, we don't, f we don't foster a culture that encourages us to deal with trauma and and sensitivity at a young age, and then going back to that thing of the girl rejecting the guy in the Black Panthers in that film, 
you know, like if I'm empowered by my vulnerability, I just go, okay, I'm sad. Okay, you don't like me, fine. But if I'm, um, if I'm, uh, if I'm empowered, if I'm not empowered by vulnerability, I'm ashamed of that rejection. Can't let anyone see. So fuck you, bitch. You ain't nothing. Do you know what I mean? And, it's, and, um, and so I, I've kind of got this thing of like, you know, like, and again, it's there was a thing in there was a thing. There was a thing that happened when. I heard my dad was dying. I hadn't spoke to him for five years. And, and, you know, I was conflicted about whether to talk to him or not. And, you know, and then, you know, I just kind of said to myself that, you know, like, I've been carrying around this shit all my life, carrying around my past with me. What about, you know, what about if, like, for the last year of my dad's life? Because, like, in 1992, when I was living with my foster family with the Lukies, and I got a call from my dad to say, come and, well, come and see me for the first time in 13 years. And my foster brother Andrew said, "You should go and see him." I was like, "No, nah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go and see him. Fuck him. I'll go and knock him out." And uh, he said, "No, nah, man, this is part of your story. This is part of your, your journey, man." So, I went to see him, and I cancelled a trip to go to the Brighton Jazz Bop with, you know, with him uh, for his 18th birthday. Went over, saw my dad, fell in love with the Murrays, fell in love with him, came back, and Andrew and four friends had been killed in a car crash. And, then when I heard, you know, like, like and it, was, you know, it, was, it was national news. And if I hadn't dropped that pain and anger, there's every chance I would have been there. You know, you don't know whether I would have because things could have happened, like, whatever. But there was a good chance I would have been. So when I heard he was dying and I had all this stuff about, like, when my kids were born, I'm not, I'm not having his bullshit in my kid's life. Then I heard he was dying and I was like, nah, man, letting go of that shit. That's what, you know, like, you know, like, you know, letting go of that shit is what saved my life before, letting go of anger and conflict. And, and so I just said to myself, what about if I can, for the last year of his life, I could be the best son I can possibly be to the worst dad I could possibly have had. And when he died six months ago, it was like this shadow lifted off me. And, and in that last year of his life, when I was there for him, for the first time ever, he showed me his vulnerability. He was great at doing it to get his way showing you his endearing eyes and he could wear it and he could wield vulnerability but he didn't show vulnerability and i saw it and uh and i heard the story of his trauma and um and you know like and i i guess all this stuff that i have is is you asked me earlier on you said to me why do you do what you do um and i think i try and fix things to fix me and that's what it is and i think i try and fix what went wrong not what went wrong what went right i suppose <laughs> like you know like uh, i have a learning platform that i that i that i a digital learning platform that is really entertaining it's all mr spark it's all Mr. Spark when he, it's all that, a learning experience that does not shame you because you cannot draw as well as the guy beside you. Because you don't like reading out when called in front of the, t it's fixing that moment. I had, a, I had a terrible stutter as a child. I have a summer camp that I run for, for, for. You had a stutter? I had a fucking awful stutter, yeah, I had an awful stutter. And it only came, at, like when it, when it hit, it hit bad, you know. And actually it was like, it was when I got to the Lukies and, they said to me, just calm down, it's okay, it's okay. And, I've, and two years later, I didn't have a stutter. Like, you know, and, How old uh, were you when you went there? So I went into, like, I ran away from home to your house when I was 12 and a half, and then social services were called in, and I was in and out of juvenile, not juvenile, in and out of um, foster care for about a year, I'd say. And then I went in around 13 and a half, I went into children's home, and myself and Andrew were like, like, like um, on the way back from the skiing trip at age 14. And we sat together on the coach, became mates. And I started hanging out with him. And his mum said, one, one night we were at a party of his, and uh, a family party. And I had to go home. And, and he said, wait, wait. his mum said, where's he going? She went, oh, he's got to go back to the children's home by 12. He's like, is it the children's home? He should come and live with us. So like at, at about 14... Um, to start 14 and a half maybe um, good people yeah good people good people and and here's another thing that forms my worldview as well do you know what we love to say we love to say that like we love to say I like I got this because I deserve it I got this because people say to me didn't you do well um, you know like because because a lot of the lads in that children's home went to prison 
I remember meeting one lad and he just said to me, when I was about 21, I met him out drinking, he was like, yeah, I saw Simon and Carl, they was in prison. Yeah, we wouldn't tell him, yeah, Dave was in there. So I was like, we were saying, you think, we, we think you're the only one who didn't go in. The girls, the girls never, the girls, a lot of the girls, most of the girls made lies for themselves, but a lot of the lads just repeated the cycle. And people said, didn't you do well? It was not that I did well. It was that I came from a family where I spoke well. I played rugby, I went to a good school. So I had, middle, I had a friends network of middle class kids that went, what are you doing here, love? Come and live with us. I'm like, first day I arrived in that children's home, one of the residential social workers went, what's a kid like you doing in here, eh? Do you know what I mean? So it wasn't that I did well, it was that I was lucky. You know, I'd like, like, I'd like it wasn't so much, so much as deserves as, as you deserve to be tall. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Or as you deserve to be clever. You just are, you know, like, and, and I landed there from a position that, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I think that's where, you know, all of this comes from, like, you know, some of those kids would grow up, some of those lads would grow up and they'd be, you know, they'd be in and out of prison and people would look at those and go, scumbags. And what they don't see is traumatized kids. Traumatized kids that never had the chance that other people had, you know what I mean? Um, you know, so, um, and again, I think, I, I think so much of it is about our vulnerability. It's about, you know, like, we love to, t we love to look at everyone as good and bad, evil and good. And I just think there's just different levels of trauma and, 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 and the hand we're given to cope with it and process it, you know? Yeah, it's a good point. You know, many, 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 many of the people who have had the shittest lives in the world and many criminals, uh, and this is not me excusing them, many, many, many of them are, are as much a victim of circumstance Absolutely, yeah. as the, the happiest, richest, most fortunate people are in the world as they are as beneficiaries of circumstance. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. polar opposites and we forget that, you know, and, and, and that's not, to, I'm not to say I'm excusing criminals, you know, or criminality, but it's, uh, you, you know, you being born where we were born, just being born in the UK, much better Absolutely. being born in the Congo, for example, in relative terms, or much yeah. being, better being born in Kiev. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In Ukraine right now. Yeah. And that's, that's the other, actually, I was, um, like I, I think that um, I think that. Do you know what? Um, I've had way too much coffee. Oh, me too. Actually, I'm wired to the moon, <laughs> and, I, and I need to go for a piss again as well. We're finishing off a minute. Oh, are we? Okay. So, 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 so everything I do in my summer camps, right? All I say to my students for going in there is, when you have these kids in there, the job is to not. Okay, you teach them a bit of stuff, but you go in, you just fucking tell those kids how brilliant they are. And if one kid's not as good as the others, you, do, you show them little tricks to make it really good. And you make every kid, you spot where they're not. So you spot where they're looking over going, oh, this is shit. And you go, fucking. So everything I'm kind of doing is kind of to fix the things that I found hard. Looking over at, you know, because I think that's one of the hardest things about school is all of a sudden you arrive in school. You arrive in secondary school and people tell you, this is the rest of your fucking life now. This is your future and you're going to fuck it up. And then you look beside you to someone taller. Next thing, the next thing, puberty hits, and some lads got pubes, and some lads hasn't. And you're in the showers, and some lads are covering themselves up, and some lads are walking in with their hands on their hips. Like you know, all of a sudden you're given grades. I tell you, you're too lazy, too stupid, or too clever. And if you're too clever, well, they're not that cool because now, now there's cool and uncool, there's popular and unpopular. All of a sudden, the, the spotlight sh is shone on what you're not, and you're trying to pretend that you're the confident guy, that you're the ladies' man, that you're the tough guy. I had a reputation of being a tough kid because I was in a children's home. It was mythology. It was all mythology. It was all fucking spin. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then I had to try and justify it. And then it became my only agency. So I, I went on my, t my teens and my 20s going out, getting drunk, taking drugs and fighting because it was my only agency. It was the only place where people said nice things about me. Oh, the what only, you perceived to be nice. What I Positive. perceived, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was the only place where I yeah. felt, you know, and... Uh, and then I think like, you know, like, like I, uh, I think that then, then all of the, and, and then I met people who freed me from me, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, and, and I made connections with, you know, like, and, and again, always, uh, what I would always say to all of the people, all of the lads I teach is, look, write down what you love about your friends, about what you, write down what you love about the lads you love the most. Write down the moments where you became friends. It's always where you, you peel back that armor and show your heart. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
and the, and the great irony of uh, of uh, the one thing we get right in the manosphere is we use balls as a metaphor for our strength. He's got big fucking balls on him, that lads. We use our most vulnerable part of our body as a metaphor for strength. If we get that one right. <laughs> like, you know, can, in actual fact, the lad with the smallest balls that no one can see is sort of the least likely to, he can't take a kick to them. You know, what I, mean? like, you know and I think uh, what, I, what I find really exciting about all this, right, we talk about it. We talk about it and like, you know, and, and we say that like, you know, like that, you know, like, you know, those moments where as lads when we just fucking go, I, I feel we get lighter as we talk about it. Do you know what I mean? We get, we seem to, and that's how I felt when my dad died. Is like all of a sudden I felt so much of the shit I was carrying, you know, like, uh, like, like, like some of the shit I was pretending to be, and all of a sudden it's like, ah. Oh. Also, I, I grew up with the, with the shadow of my father, people going, he's going to be like his dad. And then when he died, it was like, ah, oh, now it was like the last bit of me, you know, being set free. Mate, it's been a pleasure. How can people? Um, how can people check out what you're doing? Uh, the, uh, so you're they can go to the website www.inspireland.ie, inspireland.ie, and um, and thanks for having me on here, man. It's this right, is I'll put the this is go. great work you're doing, by the way, Hugh. And again, I love, like, again. You mean with my uh, research into laws of attraction? No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, I, I'll tell you what I fucking uh, love about this, right? What, what made me really proud was w when I hear you, when I hear you hitting, hit, hit, like hitting notes about mental health, about reaching out to each other and the brotherhood that you have. There it is. There it is fucking right there. Right there. It's what connects us. United we stand, divided we fall. But we connect. Like the, we connect together, basically, to identify the weak bits of the hull and we patch it up for each other. Do you know what I mean? And like, when I walk into a school saying like, I can't take a slag in my weakness, when I see it in the other lads, I go, fuck me neither. It's okay, that's fine. No, it's there. I'll sail with that to the wind. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know. Yeah, if, yeah. if that, I mean, that example, if you don't, if you don't, realize that early on that will destroy your fucking life oh, it'll rip your mind yeah. apart. you see it all the time see yeah all the time. yeah just, you know just, especially just, obvious in the celebrity world yeah especially, that's the most obvious example of it but yeah that, yeah it, it's common across joe joe public you know? can i just uh share with you a story i heard actually before we finish up yeah, well, i heard this uh this guru talk about an alcoholic and he was talking about an alcoholic in india who said his wife said i'm gonna leave you he said uh because you're going to drink yourself to death. So he said, I'll give up drinking. So if you drink again, that's it, we're done. So he gives up drinking and his life goes amazingly. He got fucking business starts going really well. He lands a deal, becomes rich overnight. Six months later, he goes, fuck it. I'll have one to celebrate. So this guru says, the thing about the alcoholic, the alcoholic is like the yogi, for he is timeless. And next thing, nine o'clock turns into four o'clock in the morning. And the thing about the yogi, about the alcoholic is he also like the yogi insofar as he reaches awareness and the alcoholic realizes the world is round and it is spinning and he finds it very hard to stand up and he says he describes this guy walking home he makes it home thinks i made it falls in a bush cuts his face to ribbons and um and he says uh he says he goes in and goes, fuck it, the wife's going to leave me. So he goes into the bathroom, patches himself up, fixes his face up, sleeps in the spare room. The wife comes in in the morning, says, you prick, you were out drinking last night. He says, I know, but look, no harm done. She says, no harm done, what do you mean? She brings him to the mirror and says, look at that, you fool. And the bathroom mirror is covered in plasters. And what this yogi says is, the problem with us all is we're trying to fix the reflection of ourselves. <laughs> and on that note <laughs> cheers man that's been excellent See man. Nice cheers man thank you <laughs>